You are listening to the bomb hole. Bomb hole podcast. It's going to be very hot. It's going to be very uncomfortable for everybody. <laughs> the bomb hole. I'm going to slide down in big hills. You know what I mean? On a big, nice, burgundy snowboard. Okay, here we go again. We are back in the booth at the bomb hole. Our first remote on location episode in Mammoth Mountain. Now, uh, Stony Buds, how are we doing, my friend? So good, my dog. Always love hearing that. Now, to my left, we have Sparky, a.k.a. McLovin, a.k.a. Mark Mick, a.k.a. Mark McMorris. What's happening? Hey, glad to be here. How the hell are you guys? We're doing great. We're doing great. Uh, with COVID, we haven't had many Canadians. Is this first Canadian? I think this is first Canadian. Oh. Yeah. It's a big, honored. big deal. Truly honored. Thanks yeah. for having me, boys. Stoked to have you. Yeah, putting the... Country on your back right yeah, now. Right Not now. the first time. Uh, <laughs> Regina, Saskatchewan. It's Regina, Regina. Regina City. There I am with fun. I've checked into many <laughs> flights, and um, I've had them boots. tell me that I'm saying it wrong. I was like, no, 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 no. I'm from this piece. Um, yeah, so everyone's technically from Regina. Regina. So what's good? Uh, paint us a picture of what Regina's all about. I, first of all, I flat. love saying it. It's, it's flat, like It's like, right? what, farm town, or what are we talking Yeah, here? so Saskatchewan, land of the living skies. That's our slogan. Um, can watch your dog wanna run away for three miles. It's the flattest place on earth, pretty much. Um, we had a grain farm. That's what, we, that's what people do there. You either make it to the NHL or you become a farmer. Craig and I were lucky enough to break that mold and get out into the snowboard world. Um, because of some really rad um, kids we looked up to that were a little bit older than us that were really into the shred. So um, it helped us get out of get out of there. But a beautiful place to visit in the summer. And uh, it has a 290-foot vertical hill that we learned the basics on. And, yeah, you, you see it in snowboarding. Not all the best riders are from the best locations. So. Your dad's a grain farmer, huh? He was. Yeah. And... Uh, then he got into politics and was the health minister of Saskatchewan for a long time. And I think now he is the minister of liquor and gaming. Jeez. And what does your mom do? My mom is a nurse. So every, Indeed. when we did, when we did, first of all, let's give them a new hair <laughs> on. Oh, that's a, it's a little loud. But um, I think after, you know, we did some intel trying to get ready for this interview. And everybody that we talked to basically said that your parents kick ass. Right. Yeah, I owe a lot to them. They are uh, some really stand-up people, and that definitely shaped Craig and I uh, tenfold. Yeah, in in what way? What kind of what kind of stuff did they instill as a kid? And like just proper manners, how to treat people. Um, yeah, just real basic stuff that'll go a long way, and uh, I'm forever grateful for it. Love hearing that. Um, now, I believe that you're. Your dad, he goes by the nickname D Block, correct? D Block, yeah. yeah. D Block. That's a that's a f- flattering nickname. I think it it's is. awesome. I, I wish my nickname was D Block personally. C Block. I'm down for E Block. Yeah. E Block. Anyone can block it up. <laughs> so that kind of brings us to our first guest question, and uh, it's from D Block himself. Here we go. Uh, hey, hey, Marco, um, or Sparkle, whichever one you want to go by. It's. Uh, your mom and dad, as some people call us, D block and C block, which I'm not sure that's flattering or not, but we just wanted to know if you still remember the time we were in Kimberly, you had got, you and Craig, we had given you forum boards and boots from off axis, because Danny Elder said that's what you need to ride. And somebody left their board out when we told them to put it in the locker and it went missing. Do you know whether that was you or Craig? question great question don um yeah i was so lucky i remember i had a 133 jp walker and that was the best thing that i owned at the time and yeah i did i I left it outside the ski chalet and sure enough it got swooped and i was a sad puppy the next morning um i had to get on like a kemper or something from the rental shop it was so busted um, but yeah, I learned my lesson and thank you for the question. D block and C block. 
Now, uh, upon uh, doing some research and speaking with them, it sounded like you guys had a cool little snowboard program where, uh, I don't remember the name of it, but you guys would drive super far over to like the Banff area every weekend. Can you tell us about that situation? Yeah. When I was 11 or 12, and Craig would have been 13, Team Saskatchewan started, so there was some provincial funding behind it, and this really rad guy, Russell Davies, huge air horn, um, was an amazing snowboarder and definitely the best snowboarder I had ridden around at the time, and he took it upon himself to take kids that were aspiring to snowboard out to Banff, which is a six, seven-hour drive. We'd leave Thursday after school head out and literally ride from start to finish all those days and then drive back through the night. And then my mom would make us go to school on Monday. But that is a huge, huge uh, breakthrough for Craig and I to become the snowboarders we were. We got to ride the mountain and ride some bigger terrain. And Russell Davies wouldn't even let us go in the park. He would make us like learn to free ride and ride your board strong and have board control and things like that. So um, for that, I am also forever grateful. That was a really neat experience. Are we talking ski sunshine? Sunshine village. Sunshine village. Lake That's Louise, what, yeah, I've been up there. Mount Norquay, Mount Nakiska. Awesome, awesome town, awesome yeah, mountains. They breed some amazing borders. Oh, out in Berta. Yeah, Berta. Berta, long Triple drive, Triple A right? beef. Yeah. I got a quick Patreon question. Yeah, let's since slap we're, one. Let's smack talking one about your parents. Yeah. Um, as a father of a 14-year-old shredder, I'd love to know what things Mark's parents did that he found helpful or encouraging in his development and or things that he felt were counterproductive to his progress. I really want to feel the stoke for my son, but I don't want to be sure that I don't ruin his enjoyment in the process. That's how I worded it. That's from Aaron. That's a great question. Great question, Aaron. Um, I would say my parents were really cool in the sense that if we didn't go to school, that was fine, but we had to finish our homework and we could go shred as much as we wanted. And they were super supportive of snowboarding and they loved to be on the mountain and we got to share that as a family, which was really cool. Um, I would say some of the counterproductive things were when they didn't really think I could make a living out of it and I would have to come home from trips to go to school. Um, and those were the tough times, but very, very seldomly did those moments take place. And that was when we were really young. When I turned 14, 15 and started competing in some bigger events and having some support, um, the school thing wasn't such a priority and I could do it on the road, but yeah, just finish your homework and your parents will let you shred. I'll tell you what, when I was, uh, 17 and a half, I graduated high school, told my mom I was moving out to Vail. Not going to college, tears. Mm -hmm. Life ruins. You're going to be really regretting this moment. Um, so, did you get your grade 12? Cindy's not going to like this one. <laughs> <laughs> C-block! <laughs> Shit. Let's give Cindy a quick little uh, air horn. A little booster. Yeah. Um, I got halfway through grade 11, and then... well. I, I got through grade 10, and then that school kicked me out because I missed more than 70 days. And then I was in this WHL program, which is the Western Hockey League, and I would go to school with those kids. And then I missed too many days for that program. And Mark McMorris? Miss Mark Mc... What am I trying to Mick say? Miss and school. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. Mark uh, Miss. Boy. More school. Yeah, that was tough on my mom, but... I didn't get my grade 12 to answer your question, no. Um, and maybe I'll get a GED someday, but at this point, I'm not feeling like school would have taught me half the shit I've learned on the road. Life lessons. Well, you kind of breezed over the fact that you uh, played some puck. Now, is the kid nice with a piece of lumber? What kind of position are we talking here? I played competitive hockey. I played tier one hockey. And oh, Canadians I, are loving this I, right now. <laughs> I played <laughs> center and right wing. Oh, and True athlete. I loved hockey, and honestly, there was one year I kind of had a coach that I didn't really like, and I forgot my neck guard one practice, and he made me, like, skate laps the whole practice, and this is when I was really getting into snowboarding, and I was just like, yo, this is whack. I love hockey, 
but there's no one telling me the right way or the wrong way how to snowboard and I can have any friends there with me they don't need to be on my team you know and that was kind of the turning point for me and hockey so yeah I I love you know the conventional sport aspect because I think it kind of individual sports that are just kind of me, me, me. I think there is some great aspects about being on a team and team wins and assists and totally, you know, and you learn how to lose, you know, you learn how to lose. That's a great point from, from conventional sports. Did you take any of that like uh, work ethic or discipline and, and apply that to snowboarding? Would you say? Yeah, I think a hundred percent. And the fact that when we do get sponsored and we're on a team to have that background in team sports helps you treat it as a team and want to help your buddies do well and progress and get get noticed and things like that. So I'm I'm super grateful for being able to play team sports and I played every sport under the sun. So um, I wouldn't change that for the world because it does teach you hella life lessons. Now, um, one thing I think we could take from hockey, I want to get your take on this. Um, Buds and I, we ordered up... Uh, we. I ordered up some sniffing salts the other day no because way. we yeah. always see the guys in hockey. They're whacking them before their shift, right? Yep. So Buds and I, uh, we, hit, we hit the sniffing salts and we, were, we actually on air. <laughs> and I was kind of thinking at the top of the run, I could see you kind of hitting a sniffing salt. Uh, I'll make you a bet. If I'm in finals come Monday, you I'll rip some? one before. <laughs> yeah, one yeah, yeah, let's go. Dude, Dude, I, have, some in I, have, I have companies in my DMs. From Hit sniffing it. salt? Yeah, what? sniffing salt companies trying to get me. Let's do get this. Get me dialed so I will keep you guys in mind next time. What What are they like? Uh, uh, dude, they, they open up all of your lungs so and, and kind of capillaries, and you just, it's like, it just it's, wakes you up. Yeah. You know, like it, honestly, like X Games. Right before you drop in, like I don't know why everybody is not hitting sniffing. Yeah, they salts. literally like you're just like. Ah! <laughs> That's amazing, it. and it's crazy like to see how many of the NHL players are zipping them right before their shift, mm -hmm. opposed to ten years ago. That they was smell not really a thing. Weird, yeah. So maybe it's just slowly making its yeah. way into the snow. I think we well, could, I think we should start making bomb hole sniffing salts. Yeah, and random. Just, I think there's a huge market for that in snowboarding. Dude, Massive. I um, mean, it would help me out on just even photoing. in the streets, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, definitely in the even streets. Switchback lip a kink. Oh yeah, zap one. Or zap it. <laughs> if you're pulling a bungee, it actually it could help as well. It's a great oh, alternative yeah. if you're really in. If you get the knocked out stuff. too, that's wake you right up. That's what well, they do with the boxers. Another thing I was thinking too, while we're on the subject of conventional sports, you know, I go to the gym a lot. I like going uh, going to war on the squat rack at times and one thing i like to do is you, you get the chalk you kind of you get the hands chalked up yep right you maybe you do a little lebron it kind of it goes in the air like you're feeling good um you're snowboarding you're taking a slope style run right why the hell aren't you chalking up your gloves <laughs> you're grabbing on the board you're not gonna lose you're gonna be able to hold on better that's a true story yeah, and there's been times that i've been in contests and zip out of my grab because, wow yeah it happens man Geez, they pulling. We're potentially <laughs> looking for investors for bomb hole chalk and sniffing salts, Mark. Salts. We could get you on. We're trying to get on Shark Tank. Um, I think we could. We I could can't pull believe you've been in. hitting up. You got hit up by sniffing salts. Yeah, companies. dude, like uh, multiple companies, and it's a it's a market for sure. Yeah, big be. old Red Bull helmet, and then just a big old uh, bomb hole sniffing salts logo <laughs> right slapped on there. Prime real estate. Yep. yep. So I also have a note. Uh, your brother said something something about your stick. You wanted me to bring up like something about roasting your stick. You use is that your hockey stick? He was roasting my hockey stick. He said he said something about. Uh, let me see if I can find this making note. Making fun quick. of his hockey. Yeah, he's stick. making fun of your hockey stick. He said stick choice and his slap shot. You should bring those two things up. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, there was a time when I'd come home from every practice. I love ripping clappers. Who, and, yeah. oh, and let's just let's give an air uh, horn for for, for the layman. What's ripping a clapper? <laughs> That's taking a, a slap shot? super hard slap shot. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I loved that. I love slap shots more than anything. And I would literally come home every day and tell Craig my slap shot has gotten so much better. <laughs> and, yeah, and that's exactly what he's referring to. And then. Um, just sticks. I cared so much about my lumber. Okay. And yep. like I would beg my parents for new sticks and I'd save up all my money to get like a Z bubble <laughs> or something. And yeah. And then there, there was a time where there was a goalie playing for the Minnesota wild and he would get me these TPS responses with my name on them. And oh, stuff. wow. I was hyped. Yeah. Let's give that guy an air horn yeah. just for that. You guys ever see the movie Slapshot? 
Old school movie. Oh yeah, yeah. good classic. Epic. Classic. 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 Yeah. Another classic hockey movie, Goon. Goon. Love Goon. Dude, Goon. There's a yeah. Goon too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're a hockey family from Massachusetts, and I remember just garage panels, teeing up slappers. You know, oh yeah. Wristers, just piece of lumber, and a skating out on the fucking pond and just dangling, thinking you're Patrick Kane out Dude, there. Until yeah. I was 12, Fearless. we had tickets to the Whalers, Bruins, Woo! Rangers. No way. Yeah, my dad was way into it. We lived in Connecticut. Yeah. Right behind the goalie. So, season so what's your guys' wow. team? You guys don't have a team uh, right where you're at, so what's your no, you Sus- Flames? He goes. Saskatchewan doesn't have an NHL team, but Winnipeg brought back the Jets recently, and one of my childhood best friends was drafted there, so I was really inclined cheering for the Jets. He's now playing in Europe, so I have a lot of friends on Toronto and some friends on the Flames and in Calgary. I'm cheering for all the Canadian teams What's besides the, the team? Habs. Besides the Habs. Uh, Montreal Canadiens. Also the Bruins rivals as well, so yeah. we don't really rock with them no. as well. You know what I noticed? I watched Craig's stories, your brother Craig Mick. Let's hit him with a quick air horn. And I, I know like if anybody that's been out and had the luxury of going out on a boat and that can like – there's like showmanship, you know, like, and, and, um, I've been out on boats and tried to do the, the barefoot water skiing and I've seen yeah. Craig is like nice with it. I was trying to do it and I would like kick off the ski and basically step into a whole fly swatter. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, you got the, you got the barefoot cause that's kind of, let's slap some respect on the barefoot. Yeah. yeah. That's literally like when I said we stopped strapping into the waterboard <laughs> and we started, wake surfing and then we had a, a jet ski so we would always um we'd always go barefooting anytime it's super calm we love to barefoot and don't do it off the ski sit down on a wake skate and then pin the sea dew and then you can just stand up and you're off to the races really yeah. that's a pro tip that is a pro tip and once you're up you're you're good it's it's actually a really easy act but yeah you can get bodied too of you course. uh fun fact you ever hear how blotto lost his finger Dude, I I've heard like 88 stories. The real story, wakeboarding off a dock, the rope wrapped around his pinky, popped oh, it off. Oh, I thought he was like pulling a rope in or he was wakes. I've heard so many different stories. He was jumping, stories. doing the pull off the dock and it wrapped and just popped his finger. Wow. They pulled in the rope and the finger was still attached. No. Lake Havasu and they- Didn't they throw a keep it on ice or something They like put that? it on ice, put him in a helicopter to the closest hospital, couldn't reattach it, got like a $20,000 hospital bill. Give wow. Blotto, gotta give Blotto. But he talks a lot of good stories about yeah, how it happened. He is a true many stories. True good sport about that one. So so earlier you kind of brought up air awareness quickly, but um, you know, I've been watching you here we're at this event called Red Bull Recharge right now. And uh watching all you guys that ride slope style, it's it's really fun for me because it's just your your guys is like the thing that blows my mind is like the air awareness, you know, like you guys go off the jump. You go back rodeo or front end double or whatever direction you go, and it just seems like you just always know where you're at and keep it so chill. Like where, I'm just curious. Like how did you develop that air awareness? Is that you know trampoline snow? How the fuck did you get so good at being comfortable in the air? I think the the main thing that helps with air awareness is just reps at things, going through the motions of. A backside double cork 1080, may it be, or a backside triple or a frontside triple. I remember when I first did a backside 1440, I was really scared to try it again and didn't necessarily know where I was when I would try it and sometimes would get incredibly bodied. But then over time, you just start to get comfortable and know where to look and know the feeling of how high you are, how much time you have, or if you need to pull it harder or whatever. And that's just like continuously happened with tricks. And that's what I give the testimony to is like reps at things make you understand where you are. The more backside rodeos you do, the the easier they become and the easier they become to just like do on a new feature because you know where you are in the trick and how much airtime you have. And yeah, air awareness comes from... Uh, repetition. That's a, no, that's a great fucking answer. Makes um, sense. I'm absor- absorbing that like a sponge myself hearing that. And one thing for the listeners and viewers that is important for them to know is like you ride bell to bell. Like even since I've been here, you've been like I'm one of the first people on hill, one of the last people off. And I think that's important for anybody that's listening that's like, how do I get good at snowboarding? It's like fucking time on the board. Yeah, ride a lot. And when you go riding, 
think about the things you want to work on and um, don't do things you can do perfectly every time. And sometimes I get stuck in those ruts. I'm like riding and there's a bunch of people around and they're like, oh, that's more like, I don't want to just like eat shit all the time, but like that's how you get better. You got to try things you aren't good at and you got to put your ego aside and just work on things. And um, that's a, that's something that I remind myself of a lot. And that's really cool to hear. And as an observation for myself, I was talking to Emma Crosby. She's a younger um, woman on Solomon and she's coming up right now. She rips. And she's a ripper. Totally. And I was telling her, you know, she, like she, she takes slams and I was kind of telling her like, like all the, all the great greats take slams. Like when I film with Lyft or Bodie or people that have been around, they're trying hard and they like Jed, for example, I've seen him slam so hard, you know? And it's like all the, all the best dudes take slams. I think. Yeah. It's part of the game. You gotta, you gotta slam to learn. And if you're, <laughs> if you're not slamming, you're not trying hard enough. Mm -hmm. And it's also, it's cool to fucking try hard straight up. It's, yeah, it's, it's cool not to cool to not try. Mm -hmm. That is so something of the past. Mm -hmm. I'd like to throw in a quick page question. Yeah, if you guys are down along the lines of what we're talking. This is from Riley Johnson. What up, Bombhole and Marky Mark? What is your routine for the day to get you hyped leading up to a big competition such as food, music, warm-ups? Yeah, surrounding myself with the right people. When I'm at a contest, I got to be staying with my boys. And keeping the vibes high, taking care of my body is a big thing. If I do a proper warm up, I'm not nervous about going shredding hard because I know I've warmed up the correct things. I'm not injury prone that day. Um, and just getting through that mental hoop of knowing you're going to be okay and not worrying about the factors that could come into play. And then music is huge, good food, thing, things like that are super crucial to a good performance. What type of music? Yeah, that's what I know. What, what do you, what are you gets us slapping? Hyped. What do we, we need to know? The heavy hip hop on That's Pompe. what I'd want to hear. What? Give us some names yeah. here. We need names. names. Name names. Lil Baby slapping lately. <laughs> okay. L Lil, Lil yep. Baby slaps. You get behind that. And then sometimes I'm with Dan at contests, and then we're on the bluegrass train, <laughs> but he has severely transferred into a hip-hop head really yeah i've got him on the hip-hop hard mm. to me bluegrass you're gonna botch your run that's that's gonna throw off my whole shit wrong vibe wrong vibe it, it, works does for the, him does I guess. the bluegrass hey, hit he did pretty yeah. good for a long time <laughs> <laughs> uh while we're on the subject of music uh i get another guest question the guest question is once again presented by solomon here we go hey mark it's i man i got a question for you <laughs> Why don't you ever let me DJ? And is it too street for you? Oh, dude, eat. That's Ika Backstrom for the record for those. Ika Backstrom, Finn's favorite, a favorite of the Finns and the Americans. Um, he lives down the road for me in Encinitas. We've became great friends over the last seven years. I was always a huge fan of his snowboarding. But, yeah, when we get together and we're having drinks, he'll jump on my Sonos and just start playing aggressive Easy e Sun's still up, blasting off the balcony. I have, like, there's, like, kids in the house, like, our friends' kids and shit. And yeah. Um, he likes the gangster, There's a right? time for I Ika's DJing, but it's not all the time. And, uh, God, do I love that guy. He's the best. You can DJ anytime now. Sorry, Ika. So, and then part two is... It, is so it's kind of like is it too street uh, for you? Ika's pretty gang related. <laughs> no, he's the he's, he's, a, he's a white fin with super bleach blonde hair <laughs> and the nicest guy ever. But yeah, sometimes maybe it's just a little out of my genre or my era, so mm -hmm. so to speak. I have to say he still has it, dude. Up yeah. there today, oh, yeah. looking good. Also, uh, he he's very vo uh, vocal in the air. Yeah, he's like, oh, I do not think I'm gonna make it. <laughs> No way. <laughs> yeah, one of those guys. Well, dude, he pulled up a couple of days ago before this contest started, and the first lap I got up to the mountain, he was doing a front seven melon on the mm -hmm. jump and just perfect style. He's always had st the best jumping style, in mm -hmm. my opinion. And he used to get down in the streets, too. Oh, yeah. He's got a mean switchback lip, front two. Switch front oh, board. Yeah. He's got moves. Peter. Also, yeah, going back to, I was like, dude, I'm in, we're interviewing Mark, like... What should I ask him? He's like, 
Man, he fucking never lets me DJ. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's what we're, okay, okay, him. that's what we'll talk about. For, all right, buds, let's uh, pay the bills real quick. We're going to get into our breakout moment presented by Pub Beer. Mark, back when snowboarding was cheap and fun, do you have a breakout moment? I would say my breakout moment consisted of a few things, but I got to narrow it down and say the fact that I got connected with Jason Isaacs, also known as Ninja. He is an old pro shred turned agent who had an insane roster at the time, and I couldn't even believe he was considering me because I had made a few finals, won some Canadian events, been to the Arctic Challenge, but definitely wasn't mounting up to his roster. It Torstein. And whatnot. Yeah, Torstein, John Jay, like all the heaviest hitters. I was tripping. And, um, yeah, he believed in me, and he, he wanted to help me. And he put helped get me on brands that, I'll be on for life, you know, and help me create friendships um, by getting me on these certain brands and forever, forever grateful for Ninja. That's awesome. Uh, running it back before Burton, I, I heard you rode for a little Saskatchewan company called Class 5 Snowboards, correct? Class 5 Snowboards was an amazing experience. The guys were super shred heavy, loved it. They wanted to make boards and they made pretty damn good boards. I traveled the world with them and rode in big contests and they held up and it was really cool to just ride something from home. And yeah, they were my first board sponsor. Now talking about getting on Burton, it's, you know, even here riding mammoth watching you guys all ride together. It's just like the, the top of the top rippers basically. Uh, would you say that had any type of impact on how you snowboard today? Yeah, I think it had a huge impact on how I board and, um, the style of boarding I do. I remember just going to my first photo shoot with Burton. I'm pretty sure it was in New Zealand. And Mikkel, not a pipe rider, but we were shooting in the pipe. And everyone was just blasting. And I was like, wow, you cannot be a one-trick pony on this team. You need to be a damn good snowboarder. And that's when I realized, like, that's that's what you're held to at Burton. Like, the roster's that insane that you can't just be a one one style of snowboarding kind of guy you need to really like practice everything and become a well-rounded snowboarder and um it, it was made apparent there mickle won natural selection too right so it's yeah obvious that he can handle all, all i i remember just traveling with mickle and like we would go skate a bowl and he was just so talented at everything we did same with danny and yeah. Rubs off on you, huh? Yeah, and I was just like, damn, dude, these guys are the real deal. And and I traveled with them for the last 11 years and um, have picked up on so much and learned so much from them. And, yeah, so hyped that I can be on a company like Burton and um, even just become, like, really good friends with Jake at one point. You know, it's just insane, the, the road and the path to get there. But... Um, Everything comes full circle, and I'm grateful. You and Jake were really tight, huh? Yeah, Jake and I were the best of buds there for a while, and I am so grateful that I even lived in a time where a guy like him was still alive. You know, I could have became a pro snowboarder 10 years from now and never even met Jake, you know. And the very first time I went to Vermont in 2011, he treated me like a brother. And then our friendship just blossomed. We just... We just got along, and he was um, always interested to hear about what was going on in snowboarding and my take on it, and he really valued the rider's opinion as a whole, but he valued our friendship like crazy. It was I, I don't know why me, but we, we just got on really well and did a lot of cool shit together. 1986, went into <clears throat> the Burton Outlet, bought my first board off of Jake. You bought it off of Jake? Yeah, he was in the outlet. It was in Manchester, Vermont before Elite 140. That's so dope. Yeah, I've heard from talking to everybody doing my stuff, you know, getting prepared for this. Everybody brings up the fact that, like, you know, Mark and Jake were so close, almost like a secondary father figure for you. And I've, I just heard so many cool stories, like, after the Olympics, you guys had some really special trip, right? Uh, yeah, we – oh, man, we did so much. Like, we would always go to Europe in the fall, just Jake and I, and, like, 
test product, ride around, visit shops. Like he just loved doing shit with me and Trust I loved guys. doing shit with him. And we would have so much fun, man. That guy was literally, he had so much lust for life, even though he had everything. He, he would talk to the the door guy the exact same as he would talk to the CEO of Burton. You know, like I, I watched he, Chris do this stuff. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's good good yeah. people, man. He was just like a super good guy, and um, I learned a lot for him or from him. And he, the fact that he gave me a chance to be a part of the Burton family, and he he literally treated me like a son. It was really special. I gotta ask with Jake gone. Is the brand changed? Or does it feel the same? Are the sons living up? Yeah, I'm super proud of Taylor, George, and Timmy. They and Donna. They're stand up people. Uh, George and, is a Patreon member, by the way. Hey, yeah, George. Mucho respect. Um, yeah, the whole family's so snowboard oriented and they Donna, just want right? to do that. Yeah, Donna. Um, bless her heart. They just want to do the right things for snowboarding and they want to grow the sport and get more people involved because at the end of the day, we want people to enjoy what we get to enjoy and we want them to see what's, what it's like to be in the mountains. It's the best thing ever. We, we, we do this for a reason, you know, uh, mm -hmm. not, not for a paycheck. <laughs> One more hard question. Would Jake have let the Open go away? The Open? That was his baby. Yeah. Since the, I was like 13. Yeah, but... Easton, you got to realize COVID. Yeah, right. True. And when you have a four million dollar event and you have to sign those checks a year in advance, and you're not sure if COVID's going to go away, it's hard to really yeah invest that. You don't you think know? you would have fought for it? I don't think we would have been able to do an open with spectators and the whole yeah, yeah. vibe of the. Didn't open it go away the year before? Around. Nope. It was just a COVID year. Okay. Yeah. Well, the one thing that's you know pretty incredible with his legacy moving moving on, and I mean. There's, I don't know how many millions at this point of, of hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Burton snowboards that have been sold. Hundreds. And just that Burton, like, will always, you know, live. It's just like People a constant talk. reminder everywhere yeah. you look. You're like, Burton, there's Jake. You know, that's it. Yeah. It's, it's People cool. can say what they want, but Burton makes the, the shit. Yeah. It's a fact. They make the best product yeah. for sure and then um, do the most. <laughs> they do a lot. Yeah. yeah. What was the? There was one trip. Uh, was it Wiggly's Heli Hop? That that. Oh was, I yeah, was told that's the like, Apre Olympic. That was trip. the special trip I was told about. Yeah. So, on the Olympic year, the 2018 Olympic year, we all came back from Korea and went to the U.S. Open, and he he took us all to Mike Wiggly's up in Kamloops. Um, Which is on the a most, heli trip. It's the most expensive heli op basically in North America. But yeah, sorry. Yeah. Continue. Yeah, no, no, no. And we stayed in Mike Wigley's house. What? Mike Wigley gave us his house. And like, we got a Yumu, everyone. And dude, I'll never forget just like landing in Kamloops and the, the people come on the plane to like check stuff. He's like, you get one photo with these guys' medals. <laughs> like, he's like, I'm going to own these customs agents right now. And we like take a photo and then just walk off. Like, it was the like, <laughs> most insane insane thing i've ever been a part of but anyways we had just like this stellar heli trip we had blotto there shooting photos but it was literally just a soul boarding trip and he just wanted to take us on it so he just wants to shred and it was all the dudes yeah. that did the olympics and danny and kelly right or something like that yeah danny and ben and kelly and yeah pretty much every burton rider that did the olympics that was at the open went on this trip and it was super special um just the fact that he would do that for his riders. And he just did a lot of crazy, like, special things, moments like that. Like, there was a lot of those things. We'd be at the round tables, Celtics are in, boom, off to the Celtics game. His like, uh, wife's family owns the team, correct? Or used to? I think they used to have part yeah, yeah. ownership. Used to have part ownership. That's cool. That's a, that's a really cool thing to be able to be a part of and – It'll never be the same, but he always yeah. used to throw that yearly party in Burlington too, right at his house where he falls out. Everybody, yeah, I yeah. heard that's that's that the was jam. Amazing. He would always bring like crazy acts too. Yeah. And yeah. Let's I remember say one to year. Jake. That, yeah. Let's send him a super. Let's give him the super. Oh, air he horn. gets it. Let's give him the super. Let's give him the super air horn. <laughs> Only reserved for the best. Yeah, we don't that we, doesn't get thrown around. No. Yeah. That's we not, miss him. Not used lightly. Yeah. Thank you, Jake. We fucking miss you, man.
Beautiful. Well, to, to change gears uh, onto another subject, and I know it's probably like annoying. You've talked about Olympics a lot, but you know, as as your career's developed, you've become the favorite per se. Um, you know, which I want to talk about a little bit later in in how I'm dealing with that as opposed to being an underdog. But leaving the Olympics with a bronze now, are you happy or are you sad? Um, first time around in 2014. I was a little bit bummed, but I was stoked on the way I rode. It's a judge sport. You can't really be bummed on what's out of your hands, so to speak. Um, I thought the judging was kind of crazy there. I don't think I should have won. Stale should have won. But um, it was fist judges, so it's kind of hard to say. Kind of a problem. I think it was a good (laughs) snowboard podium, though. It could have been a whole lot worse. I was super happy for Sage. I was stoked Sale was on there, and I was stoked to stand on the podium with them. Oh, you thought Stale should have beat Sage? 100%. You should watch it. (laughs) But Sage rode amazing, too. I guess I just have a soft spot for Sage, so it's tough. Hey, we all do. He's the nice guy ever. But I was appreciating we're just talking style. about We're just talking about the, the riding yeah. aspect. Yeah. And that happens a lot in snowboarding. And it happens at the Olympics, too. You know, it's just the way it is. It's a personal preference. Um, and it's, it's a hard sport to judge. Yeah, it's, and it's, it's even it's Chris judged. is in the yeah. cut this week. I don't know how you're doing it. I'm judging. I'm passing judgment on all these. He's buggers. accepting envelopes from riders every morning. I don't know no, if you noticed that at breakfast. It, oh, I gotta it, get on that. It is. Re- it is hard. It's it's a hard thing to judge because it's subjective. Yeah, and you're you know his fist is a bunch of nerds. But at least Chris knows what he's doing. Yeah, I and mean, I, that's what I'm saying. Like having people that have lived it and done it done it it's so beneficial to have those people in but then when you go to the wsl it's it's a real tour they pay the judges correctly it's not a weekend gig it's they they they're credited when they do well and they're disciplined when they don't you know like it's it's a real thing and in snowboarding it's just not quite there yet and we don't have a one governing body it's like we got the x games we got the do tours we got the fist events we got the natural selection like it's 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 hard as there's so many different sort of silo events um but yeah to go back to your question when i got bronze in 2018 i wasn't bummed i was stoked on the way i rode i wish i could have done some things differently on the finals run or the the very final run because if I would have played a little bit safer on the last jump, I would have done fine. But there was so many people to drop behind me that could have totally knocked me out. Ruined but they you. fell. So then you think, wow, why didn't I just do this? And whatever. And Bronze was pretty sick. Bronze I was like, fourth. Uh, yeah, and I was like dead a year prior, less than a year prior. I was literally had 17 broken bones and a ruptured spleen and collapsed lung. And I was like, there's no way. You know, so I was so stoked the fact that I could even snowboard at the level I could again, you know, nothing permanent. That's insane. Now, going back, what year was it where you smacked your ribs at X Games, the McRib year? Yeah, McRib. so I've gone into McRib every Olympics. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Going, going in somewhat hurt. At least in 2018, I was able to recover and then snowboard a lot and went to the Olympics about as healthy as I could be. Going back to 2014, the, the two weeks before, I think it was like 11 days actually before the slope style contest, I clipped on my last run in X Games doing like a switch lip on that high green bar and hooked it and then just broke my rib. Really Ping ba- to taco. Yeah, yeah. And it's taco right on the edge of the, the flat down. And that sucked because that wasn't an easy thing to go through. Everyone that's broken a rib knows it's not a comfortable thing. Um I got over to Sochi and did some cruiser runs the day of the first practice. I didn't even go near the course. And I was like, yo, I'm fucked. I can't do this. This sucks. Super bummed. And then, boom, lidocaine, hematoma block. Couldn't even feel my torso. I'm just shredding the course the next day. It's insane. Modern medicine, air horn. Just block the nerve blocker kind of thing? Yeah, it was crazy. Crazy, dude. I had a broken rib, and literally they put 12 needles in my back, like long ones, gnarly, and nah. I just couldn't feel my torso. It dude, was Ninja insane. should have pitched the McRib sponsorship for oh, that. We, that been, there was, it dude, was going it around. Was, I love things happen. I love a big fan of the McRib. I got to admit, when it really? comes to town, I buy one once every year. 
Good for you. They actually just came out. I think it's Wendy's came out with some cheddar biscuits. I saw. I so saw that too. They DM tagging. people slid yeah. into our DMs. Yeah, they got uh, cheddar biscuits. Well, speaking of cheddar let's biscuits, let's Wendy's talk cheddar biscuits. Sponsor. We got to talk bisque. Uh, well, oh yeah, we. Well, it I wouldn't mean, be a bomb hole without the bisque. <laughs> you mentioned when you were fifteen, you were getting paid. That's a place to start, maybe. Yeah. Well. Well, yeah, that was actually I mean, that's small. Maybe a when, smaller amount. If we circle back to when we chatted about my folks. Um, sort of like believing in me that this could be a career. They came out to Calgary in 2011 and there was a slope style world cup there. And at this time they paid in cash and I was lucky enough to land a good run and I won and they gave me 12,000 bucks in cash and I, for and winning or your yeah, parents did no, the, the, the event okay. winnings. Okay. And we, we went back to the hotel and my parents kind of just arrived and I was just like, yo. <laughs> and then we went to the Flames game. Let's go. <laughs> nice. Calgary, and, home of the season. Yeah, Did they, they get a W? Or? Yeah, and they were also playing against my goalie friend that was playing for Minnesota. So it was, it was a really neat time. And I was just so happy that I could show my parents mm-hmm. that, like, yo, I'm going to make a living at this, and I don't want you guys to worry anymore. And, yeah, it was pretty cool not having to ask for any help from 15 on. Mm-hmm. Well, while we're on the subject of bisque, too, I know that there's Olympic years. There's kind of weird brands that come out of the woodwork and signed you to these like uh, one year Olympic deals. Have you have you had any brands do that in the past or any that come to mind? Yeah, I've been super lucky, though. Like a lot of these partners that come on for the Olympics come on for more than just that year. Like I was on Sport Check, which is like a Dick's Sporting Goods. For four or five years and that's under the Canadian tire roof and they were super cool and they were really involved in my foundation like but yeah when that corporate money comes in it's fucking dope you got to capitalize on that and you got to set yourself up I want to snowboard and surf for the rest of my life I don't want to have to work I want to enjoy the hard work that I've put in and um, I don't think being on sport check or having a Cheerios box or any of that is selling out. It's no way. fucking rad. It's growing our sport, you know? And if anyone wants to talk shit on that, like we're actually trying to, we're actually out. trying to find out how do we sell yeah, out more? I, the most better we can sell out. The, we're trying to yeah, sell. Let's get you guys that Wendy's let's, deal. Let's, dude. Dude. let's get cheddar. Bisque. When, <laughs> anything MasterCard, you know, yeah, we will whatever. plug it. We if, if anyone wants to like, like those kind of companies want to come into snowboarding and help us out and let us still like do our thing. We Toyota has been great for that. They come in and they, they want to showcase rad snowboarding. We were just on a commercial shoot and like they hired Gimbal God. They want the dope snowboard. Are clips. they throwing cars at you? We get some cars. Woo! <laughs> that's, that's kind of better than biscuits. I would love a Chevy. Got to yeah, I'll, I'll take, would lo- I'll I would take love about a anything, dude. Truck, yeah. There's a sled in the back. I seen Louis Vito. He does the, uh, the he car does pull. The, he does the truck pull with yeah. the Toyota Tundras. I'd like to maybe do a couple of those. Like you know, um, he's pulling a truck. Yeah, he pulls. Oh, yeah. Little, he, little he pulls little you guys he, seen that dude's body? <laughs> yeah, yeah, dude, Vito, dude. He's right. like a little Clydesdale out there. Yeah, he he he's pulling that thing all the way across the fucking lot. I was saying, you know, like um. You should do. I know you spend a lot of time in the gym, and you know they, people want to say oh, snowboarding's jock. At the end of the day, if you're doing double back rodeo, fucking ten eighties, and yeah. taking slams, if you're not going to the gym, your career's over. So I don't fuck all that. If you want to snowboard, you got to go to the gym. But I love watching like NFL hype videos where the guys are out there, they're working out, they're doing like there's like some young thug in the background, and they're like running routes and stuff like yeah. that. I think we need some more snowboard hype videos. Maybe pulling some trucks. Maybe um, chalking up at the squat rack. What do you think? Yeah, I think the Salt Lake crew has been doing a great job of that. <laughs> you know, you, you guys are show he's getting. There? Yeah, and just like, dude, show that it's fine to mm-hmm. to take care of your body. I want to snowboard for a really long time, and I want to be less injury prone than the next guy. So I'm gonna do yoga, and I'm gonna lift some weights here and there in the off season. You know, that's just like, that's okay. And you even see it in skating now, man. People will be hitting the gym. Dude, Chris is trying to get me in the gym just for longevity. I'm getting old, so we'll see we'll what happens this there. summer. Oh, oh yeah, maybe look we'll at throw Bridges, another bet. dude. Maybe How we'll does he another... move the way he's? He a, does. You know what he, he does? An alien? He, he's, he's an alien. He snowboards and he doesn't eat. He eats like one meal a day. He fuels on Red intermittent Bull. Intermittent fasting. Yeah. He's doing intermittent fasting. It's cigarettes. He's not Red smoking Bull. darts anymore. Though, oh, he's smoking he? darts, but the super <laughs> light ones. Oh, just but kind of like they're like it's like air. No, he's 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 ripping them all day all over the place. 
Fuck, maybe I'm not so, paying close enough attention. But he only, he never eats breakfast. He doesn't eat lunch. He only fasting. eats dinner. It's good for your, yeah, that's great for your And just when we were coming down today, he like did some crazy hand plan. He was all like twisted up. And I was like, dude, most people of his stature, if they didn't snowboard and do this stuff, would be so pretzeled up right now. I was just like so impressed. I was like, is he going to I hot said yoga? to him today, I was like, dude, you're looking good. And he's like, I've been shredding a lot, dog. Dude, that's good. A uh, little fun fact. Uh, one time we were uh, back when I was drinking, we were getting shit faced in Southern California, and uh, I was like, "Bridges, <laughs> I bet I can beat you in a foot race." And he's like, "No, no, no." And finally, he he agrees to the foot race, like after like you know maybe an hour of us like drinking. At this point, it's like four o'clock in the morning. We go out to the streets of like Costa Mesa or Encinitas. I don't remember where we were. Small like narrow street, and I'm like, "Bridges." I'll give you five car lengths or three car lengths or something like that. I don't remember what it was, but he had a, no, the thing is three car lengths. So he had a three car head start on me. Was he and barefoot? It, and he was, he took his shoes off and he fucking, so, and somebody's at the beginning, like T-Bird is at the finish line. Somebody's at the beginning on your marks, get set, go. We take off and I see this guy's head co- go back. You know, a good athlete, like their back gets all straight and he's got like a mullet kind of thing coming back. And <laughs> Dude, I'm like, holy shit, Bridges has fucking wheels, dude. Like, he could run like a 4.8, I'm saying, like 40-yard dash. We got to get a combine going. We should actually, Seriously. We should actually get a, a sidebar. We get a Red Bull recharge we, combine. Red, 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 <laughs> we need a Red Bull recharge combine. We need to know 40-yard dashes, uh, vertical. But Zeb know. will win everything. That's true. Zeb yeah, he's got vertical. Yeah. But yeah, probably going to win the his, contest. Yeah, dude, that dude looking, is a... Literally a real life cool boarder. Oh yeah, he's he's an action. <laughs> he figure. is a cool boarder. <laughs> he is. Oh my and god. And yes, Bridges is an alien. <laughs> well, going back <laughs> to the story, but we were we were in we were we were in a sprint, or whatever. And at some point, he actually is running too fast where he can't like keep his legs up. And he did a tuck and roll, and he did this Sonic the Hedgehog roll. <laughs> It was like a full, like, over-the-front sh- Sonic the Hedgehog roll, and I beat him by, like, two strides. But had he not taken the Sonic the Hedgehog roll, he would have mopped me up. So, yeah. Jeez. Any rate. I like that story. Thanks for sharing It's that. a great story, huh? Quick page question. Yeah, hit him. Uh, this is from Dane Gordon. What hey, up, Mark. Dane? Just wondering how long people have called you Sparky, and how did you get the nickname? Keep being a legend. Thanks, Dane. Um, it's more... Like the hockey parents I grew up around, everyone just called me Sparky, and it. And then I'm pretty sure Danny Davis heard my dad call me Sparky, and it never. <laughs> Someone never, said at the hill today yeah. that Danny was. Danny really like pushed that into snowboarding. That's for great. Me. <laughs> yeah, and honestly, I I love that nickname. Yeah, it's, it's great. A, it's a great it. nickname. I guess I guess they call me that. Kind of goes with the smelling day. salts. Yeah. Sparky. Once you get that sponsorship, Sparky Selling Salts by Bombhole. <laughs> by Bombhole. <laughs> well, we got to uh, we got to test your Canadian um, cred. Is it cred? Cred. All right. Um, do you think you can name all the provinces and territories? I could probably do that, dog. Well, you could try it first. Okay. I don't think you're going to come. Far. We're going to go There's east to west. Okay. okay. Uh, or actually, I'm not going to go in order because I'm just going to throw them out. How many are there? Thirteen total. Quebec. Quebec. Manitoba, Saskatchewan, um, fuck, uh, God, what am I missing? What's Calgary's? <laughs> Alberta. Alberta, thank you. <laughs> and then there's, uh, I'm already blown yeah. on, on the West Coast, dude, where Whistler is and all that. All right, let's hear all 13. Oh, I don't there's know. There's those crazy northern ones. I'm going to go on the lower New side Newfoundland? Newfoundland? Yep. Yep. All right, keep it going, Mark. British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, Newfoundland, New Brunswick. Yep, New Brunswick for sure. Um, I've been a half of these shit. And then we should go up into the Yukon, right? Yes. Um, There's also something that's like not the name. It's like a weird name. There's two weird names. In the ter- the way up ter- north, yeah, the north territory. Territory. Northwest territory. Northwest yep, territory. There's a, they, that's it. Ter- Northwest territories. You got me at nine. Yep, dude. Oh, there's I, thirteen. I, I thought I had ten. Um, dude, this is bad. I mean, I probably couldn't list off all fifty there's states. Some, there's so. some Canadians that are actually really upset. Yeah, I know. I should probably not. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been back there in a while. Um, 
Old Merck's been spinning where, a little where too much time what, in the what, States. What, are we missing West Coast, East Coast, Yeah, I think you middle, missed central? a close one by you. PEI. Yep. What's oh, Prince Edward, Edward Island? Yeah. Okay. You said, so you said Saskatchewan. And I said Manitoba. Oh, wait. No, Saskatchewan is not yeah. the you said you, Did you say Saskatchewan? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I, I, went, I went on the lower side from west to east. Mm-hmm. And then we said New Brunswick, Newfoundland, PEI. You're missing an easy one. Oh, it's uh, something it's to do with east. the maple leaves. Maple leaves? I said Ontario. Oh, yeah, you, you said Ontario. Yeah, I, like so. I'm, I'm, I'm saying here we go. Oh, thank you. British my, my Columbia. cocktail has arrived. Fat That's Gabe. Big shouts <laughs> to Fat. Fat Gabe's <laughs> delivering a cocktail to. Uh, oh, thank you buds. so much, dude. We're trying to name the. Hey, Canadian. he's got a freaking Labatt Blue. That's oh, Canadian. Uh, that Labatt is Canadian. Blue. Yeah, respect. Thank you, Gabe. Thank you for your like, patriotism. Do you want me to tell you? Here, just list them off. Okay. We have Alberta, British Columbia, Manitoba, New Brunswick, Newfoundland, and Labrador. Labrador. Nova Scotia, which I don't think so. Oh, said. I didn't say Nova Scotia. Nova oh, my God. I didn't know and that I've was been a, there. I've been and there, that's too. that's Trevor Andrew, Frankie Chapin. Oh. Trevor Andrew's Ontario. from Ontario. Uh, Newfoundland, isn't he? Yes, he is. Prince Edward Island, Nova Quebec, Scotia. Saskatchewan. Did you miss Saskatchewan? No, that's where he's no. from. I Dude, knew that. I, I, I named everything besides Northwest Territories, Nova, Nova Scotia. Scotia. None of it. And Yukon. Nova Scotia's a city, I, I thought. Said Yukon you f- you and forgot Northwest none of it. Territory. None but of it? I did forget uh, none of it. None of it's that one way, way north. You did pretty good. Honestly. I did okay, but not really. Can you guys name every single state? Well, there's 50. That's there's 50. You guys got to remember 13 is way easier to remember. Well, than 50. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I, I thought Nova Scotia was just a city. Okay, let's go. Let's go back to uh, what what I'm interested in here is is contest talk because as a fan of snowboarding, uh, I love watching the events. I love watching the slope style contest, the half pipe, the whatever. And uh, I have my personal take on the direction it needs to go. Let's just talk slope style in particular. You're kind of speaking earlier about the WSL, the World's uh, the Surf League, I believe. Mm-hmm. It. And they have it dialed in. Like, yep. people are tuned in. The audience is tuned in. So what does snowboarding need to do to build that audience? Because they're not fucking doing it right now. Yeah. It's uh, having one governing body and mm-hmm. then having one website that you go to watch it. You go to the WSL, and that's where the webcast is. It doesn't necessarily need to be live on TV. You need a webcast that works in every country that everyone can tune into and it's two clicks you know it's it's probably way harder than it sounds but it's the most beneficial way to get eyes on at every event and i think there's just too many cooks in the kitchen um you have all these different events and tours and we're competing in europe and they don't know where to watch because they they can't watch it on um euro tv or whatever you know and there's this it's it's too hard to view sometimes and that's really frustrating and that's what was rad about the natural selection you go to red bull tv and that's where you're going to watch it and it's super simple and x games you go to espn and you're going to watch it there's there are some easy things about some events but it's just everything is so different and there's a different organizing committee and it, it just makes it tricky um and then, yeah, and then the courses never really change either. It's like, oh, wow, half pipe hit. Let's put it in every slope style contest, you know? And it's just the creativity is lacking there. And the, the riders are riding at a higher level than the park builders are building at, in my opinion, at contests. True. That's a great take. What, this stuff um, should be bigger or – safer built Safe, right safer, you don't need a 70 right. foot cheese wedge step down build that oh, 70 gotcha. foot with a lot of snow built it I mean, like, the jump, landing. like the jump today i guess huh yeah like that on steroids yeah yeah with a long steep landing yeah. where the impact's low mm-hmm. and you can really dive deep in your bag of tricks and do your best stuff and whatever happened to the four jumps like people yeah. are good at spinning two ways three ways but that when when you have to spin all four ways, that really separates the field, and um, that's a great take. That's mm-hmm. good to know. For that was really beneficial for me in some years, and um, I wish that would come back. I I have a take on this stuff too because I think 
one thing I've, I've probably said it before on air a bunch, but I think the the points race is super important. Like I watch Supercross; that's what I equate it to. They race every weekend, and there's a ultimately they're going for a championship with the points, and it builds the drama, and there's a story, and it's you know it could be Mark Mick versus Dusty or versus Stolly or whoever it is, right? And and you kind of build that storyline. But it's like oh, we have the X Games here. We have this weird fist event that i don't even fucking tune into because i don't know how to find the link and and then also going back to you know you take about different waves in wsl you have different tracks and supercross like it seems like they're for the most part there's not a lot of thought in the in the slope style courses varying they go we're doing the the shark fin quarter pipe jumps now like why isn't there one maybe one's more transition focused we're going to be like this is our our transition this is our four pack jump course. This is our like kind of like theme each course to build the story around. Yeah, and, and then I think that's where events like Peace Park and Red Bull Recharge are really helping, you know, like the US Open the last year they ran, they had a modified pipe. They did it at the Dew Tour. They're trying and I don't think we're far off of that sort of like creative side and not so traditional slope style or half pipe. Um so we all just got to voice our opinions and keep working towards that greater goal of having a unique course every time we go to a contest. And um, some weeks it favors a, a different rider more than the next, you know, um, versus having that three jump line with a half pipe hit and three rails. Mm -hmm. So question two, another one randomly. Um, so a lot of writers nowadays, they grow up, they grow up hitting airbags and they grow up uh, learning a lot of their stuff into the bag and spending a lot of time snowboarding in replica snowboard setups, be it like into a foam pit, into a bag. And you can see these snowboarders a lot of times, they're very good air awareness. They snap. It's almost like a gymnastic kind of triple cork type of thing. But I like there's certain features that kind of separate them, them out on... It kind of separates uh, the field. When you need to use your edges? Yes, example. Yeah. So so what are those, do you think those features are better to have that kind of separate the the airbag trainers, per se? 100%. It's really beneficial to have transition in slope style contests because then you're not seeing those guys on the podium all the time. And it gets frustrating, you know, because you watch these guys ride down the hill and you're like, dude, how can you be on a podium in a slope cell contest, but you can, cause you don't have to turn. Mm. And then there was a really rad event in Switzerland in Korvach where they had like rails and then a real half pipe wall, 22 foot wall. And you had to like, you had to snowboard to get down it. And, um, that, that needs to happen more because I don't think the people should be rewarded for not being a strong snowboarder and a good acrobat. Facts. Fuck, I got to give you a pound Quick, for that. Let's, uh, give him, let's give him an air horn for that, too. Huh? For the layman like myself, what were the shark fins up there today? What? I guess the quarter pipe jumps are referred to as shark fins. Yeah, I the think half so. Pipe or yeah, the, the like the half pipe wall yeah. and then a jump landing. Oh, gotcha. That, that's okay. how you can't become like... Let's call the shark fin. I, yeah, let's call it a shark fin. I, I think, mean, I, I think that's what Craig's calling it. I mean, I've heard it all day, and I'm like, where is this shark fin? It does not look like a shark. No, that's why I was so confused. So I, was, I did not. <laughs> I think maybe I when they're more like spined like out, okay. when they're like spined and you can hit it from both ways. Then you know when they'll have thing. it in the middle and then the landing will be here and you can hit it like gotcha. that. Gotcha. I think that's where it That's where it came from. from. Okay. Because I was up there all day and I kept hearing shark fin, shark fin. I'm like, it, it, it does. Where's the goddamn so shark far fin? from the ocean. <laughs> Dude, I, when I swim in a pool, I'm scared of sharks. Like shark phobia is real. I grew up with Jaws, man. I think where did you grow up in Long Island? No, I grew up in uh, New York, Connecticut, Vermont. Yeah, sick. But I would be in a pool after Jaws came out and oh, swimming at night, and I'm you like, watch that as a kid. It yeah. fucked up everyone Jaws, from like, your generation. Yeah. Lakes, pools, any body of water. I think a shark's gonna kill me. Man, I I I surf a lot nowadays and Shoot. spend a lot of time in the ocean, and dude, it crosses my mind. Dude, a lot. it's all I think about. My I don't like when I'm like by myself in the ocean, no. and that's another reason I go to the peak where everyone's sitting. It's like better chances. Yeah, when you're the last <laughs> dude in the water at night, sun's down, you're waiting for that last wave. Dude, I'd like sw start sweating and dude, just it's panicking. Gnarly. We were on this catamaran in Maui, and Kai Lenny got me on his like electric foil board. And Coco didn't say anything, but like 
when I came in, she, and I was falling a lot. Like oh, she this, saw sharks. And she was like, yo, this is like the sharkiest water you could be in. Like out to sea, dusk, like sun's going down, and you're like frolicking out there. And she's like, I wasn't going to say anything, but that was the sharkiest it gets. And I was like, dude, do not let me go out yeah, there. Somebody <laughs> tell me beforehand. <laughs> Could well, you just to- imagine, like, Sparky loses his ankle? <laughs> yeah, dude, talk about a some <laughs> mishap right there, yeah. dude. <laughs> it would be legendary, though. But, uh, it would be great story. A, fa- a hand might be better than an ankle, so you still shred. What about, was it Mick Fanning that punched the sh- shark in the head? Oh, yeah, dude, somebody punched just, the shark like, in the nose. Just, like, kicked his feet yeah. so hard. If you're supposed to, that's what you're supposed to do is punch a shark in the nose, and they back down. You, gotta- you guys see that kook slams recently where the, that person's on the sup, and it, like, bonks them? And then they just like fall into the water, and then the clip ends. <laughs> I'm like, it's like what they, happened next. They would have had to know the person was okay to post it. Yeah, but you never know, man. I think when you hit him in the nose, though, they take off. It's oh, like oh, for sure, they point. don't want to eat us. They take a bite. Yeah, you're and not then the right bail. taste. Yeah, yeah. Like, this shit's sketchy. You guys been eating some fucked up food. But I'm still not trying to get that no, jaws no, bite, no, man. No, no, no. Well, scared. I think it might be that time for. Uh, a little, you know what, Ooh, buds? Name that video part. Oh, Lord have mercy on my side. Name that Okay, Sparky, this is this is big for you. This is massive. This is huge. Uh, you know, this... I've, this is what... I, I kind of forgot, and then I was riding up the chair with Fergie Ferg. Mm. Um, shouts to Ben Ferg. But he... Um, not on that soundboard, but I would give you an air horn if I was. Yeah, he he was just like, dude, I'm I'm most worried about the name that video part, and I and it came to my attention that that's what I'm most worried about. Well, it's good for your core score. You know, the course you, you're a contest guy. You're not expected to do well, but um, let's just let's. Just, oh yeah, first of all, confidence level uh, zero through ten. What do you got? I don't know. Depends on what um, what era we're working with. I, I watched. I've watched snowboard videos my whole life, but the ones that really sit deep in my brain are the older. What's flicks. the first one you ever saw? That's a um, good True Life, maybe. That's and a that's classic. A, wow, what a starter What's, what's the other one that, like, you never knew? JP's oh, that's uh, Technical Difficulties. Technical Tech Difficulties. Diff. That was the first that one song. I... I almost did that song. Really? That's like a, that's like the video part I've watched the most in me my too. life. Me too. Me that's too. That's the one that did it for me. That's, Same. That's the one Dude, that did heavy, Like that J.P. Videos. Walker part did it for me. Same. That was and, how I got hooked on snowboarding. Mm-hmm. Like, everything. Yep. And then Derelictica, or how do you yeah, say Delictica. it? <laughs> I don't know. We were know. talking about this the other we day because it's I said, I call it Derelictica, but I don't know if that's right. That's the Zoolander clothing line. That was an amazing flick. Yeah. Like, just the riding level. I, that was Andreas, kind of the first time I saw Andreas, and he just back Rodeo 7s, that super nuts clip. I was like, who? Yeah. What? You can dare lick my balls. If you it's know also a Zoolander If you report. dare. <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay. See how you do, Sparky. Okay. Arrow at the love <laughs> following me around. Street cred heavy, through the roof. Heavy track right there, yeah. too. Such a good Come part. on, Eileen. Dude, Come back on, Eileen. Ready. Double back rodeo 10, first of its kind. You got that, that quick. Follow me around. We, I'm pretty sure we got that in the back of the Odyssey. <laughs> <laughs> the Honda Odyssey. Wow. I kind of thought that was a cocky name for a snowboard video. Follow me around? Whatever. Bittner was in that, right? There's yeah. a lot of bad Bittner snowboard Bittner had is a really good yeah, section Bittner, in there. Bittner, and Bittner crushed. That's when Heike was still filming mm-hmm. a lot. I loved watching Heike. So. Yeah, the, those, that was kind of the height. That was, that was one of the heights of Mac Dog era. I just felt like they were telling everyone else that they follow them around to all the spots. Like, Mac Dog <laughs> thought they were better than the rest of the crews. I'm not sure. I, I, yeah, I don't know. I remember me meeting Mac Dog for the first time, and I was just like full-on starstruck. And this was like later in my career. Like, I had done a a lot of things, but I was just over the moon meeting him. And dude, I, I mean, like, that guy, dude, he made a lot of legendary it, snowboard parts. Oh, Probably half the reason we have an air horn yeah. package right now, but yeah. air horn delivered to Mac Dog. Okay, for part two of Name That Video Part for the listener viewers, uh, when this podcast comes out, if you know the answer, comment on the photo of Mark Mick with the song and the video part, and you'll get yourself a prize pack. You will get this prize pack. Now, we're going to let this one ride a little bit because it's an absolute slapper. Here we go. Huh? 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 Huh?
Yeah. Woke up in this bitch, don't see no flow. With some G code, go to run the back, yell at East Coast. A little bit of Henny and some weed smoke. smoke. And some Glee coke, tell my free coke, keep my drink coke. She gon' buy that pussy for the weed show. Hey, we got talking to some pussy. Yeah, that one's got a bit. I want to say props to whoever made that beat. Seriously, that's is that too street? Hard. Too street for you, Mark? Yeah, if you put if if you could put that on the car, you turn that off, or you can keep it. No, I'd fuck with that. Okay, that but mean, um, I, wrong, I'm man. I'm completely lost. But I, like, if I had to guess, I don't know. Like, it's actually for the uh, we'll, beep it, we'll beep it. We'll beep it out if it you, out know if it you get it right. Take a stab at it. Yeah, I would say like, is it like? Fuck. I want to say like. Yeah. Good, good, good way to go. But good guess, incorrect. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you who it is. We'll beep it out. It's. Oh my god. It's a and that dude. One. I love you too. So I'm so sorry. You're the fucking man. And I love uh, your we got to see him dance to it just two days ago. Yeah, he was doing was, some high knees. He was which, doing some which, sort of trip walk. Which to flick? It. Uh, we'll give the listeners a big hint. It's in a video grass movie. Yeah. Uh, not we, video won't gracious. say which one. We will we'll not get, say which one. Get rates on that. No comment. I'd like to go on record saying. Hey, I'd like to kind of use my option to not comment on that at the moment. Hey, did they teach you any good techniques for dodging uh, questions when you did Olympics? Did you get any of that training? Yeah, you just fucking take it where you want it. <laughs> what do they say? Like, before you go on those big talk shows. Dude, they I give actually, you any, they you give you I feel like not so much in the last go around, but like the first time snowboarding slope style was in the Olympics and Red Bull Canada had a bunch of us going. We had like... This crazy media seminar and seminar. Yeah, I don't think I took a lot out of it, but I've I, I haven't struggled too much in that realm. Like I I don't say stupid shit, but I don't think about saying stupid shit. I don't want like yeah. I, I just answer how I feel, and I feel like it's usually not too offside. Um, but yeah, there's definitely some keys to uh, getting out of sticky situations and no comments a great great one yep. for it <clears throat> it was it was like watching louis vito navigate uh we were trying to ask him how much money he made Should and the way he could just kind of jedi mind trick us should we that. take us out of name that video part real quick oh yeah yeah good call thanks buds thank you guys for playing <laughs> name that video part. <laughs> it's a great part <laughs> oh man i'm i'm actually completely rattled on the I, I wish I wouldn't have guessed because I'm upset. With I'm yeah, like, dude. <laughs> fucking man. The There's going to be a lot of beeps going on right now. Beep, so we beep, 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 beep. Uh, <laughs> let, let's, uh, let's you guys beep out swears? No, no just because it's for the listener. So the listener doesn't still knows. Oh. They get a sticker pack if they guess the second one. But we like to but give when they, and Oh, so they don't guess until the, first the one's episode for you. comes uh, out. He didn't get his prize pack. Oh, my God. It's getting after five. <laughs> My brain starts shutting down in the evening. That's, I'm a morning but person. But I wake up, so it's... Uh, we didn't have the cooler on this trip, but we got you a bomb hole prize pack with the mug, a beanie, all of the items available at bombhole.com. Thank you so much. He probably looks good in Yeah, we, we'll, throw, we'll give you one of these uh, buckets, bomb hole bucket hat. Actually, we you have a like whole... like a dude who wears a bucket on the beach. I could yeah, see... Yeah, I'm bucking in. Bucketing. I could see the bucket the hats just sails through the roof after yeah. he throws after one of Mark those things makes off. Wearing one of those, sniffing some salts. Wearing yeah, the bomb hole <laughs> sniffing salts. <laughs> if you'd like to invest? We're going to do our first. Uh, what do they call it? Like the Series Seven when they try to raise their money or something like that. Mm -hmm. Investors, possibly you. <laughs> We're going to do a phone a thon to have people, Patreon members, phone in to yeah to be a part of it. Yeah, I love it. So I, I want to dive back into some some stuff personally that's interesting to myself. Now. You have be kind of become the guy as far as contests, right? You're favored to win. They're like, oh, shit, Mark's mix here. He's, he's the fucking guy, right? And, and so what I'm interested in is when you're, fav when you're kind of the favorite, how does that affect you when you don't do well, and how do you deal with that mm. pressure of being the favorite as opposed to the underdog? Yeah, it, it hurts. A little bit more. I think I, I definitely wear it on my sleeve when I don't do well. I, I'm i not throwing fits or anything, but I'm super bummed on myself. And just knowing what you're capable of, maybe you had a great practice and it just doesn't go your way. And sometimes that happens, but um, it sucks. I, 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 I just like to do well. And I know, yeah, like I said, I know what I'm capable of. And then when it doesn't work out, it just 
it, it hurts. It hurts for a couple of days for me. <laughs> I don't, I don't like, there's a lot of people that are just like, boom, hanging out, like psych, drinking beers, like after the contest. But if I don't do well, I don't really like want to be there. Like I want to go hang with my tight knit crew and watch some footage and see like what might've went wrong and where I could maybe improve on it the next time. Next time. <laughs> Next time. Is it pressure on yourself or do you think pressure from your people, your Just agents, the fact your that, sponsors? Yeah, I, I, I like to like get down on myself. I don't like to, but that's what happens. I get bummed on myself because, yeah, there's like everyone's watching, wants you to do you. well. Um, you got a whole You have camp. all this support. You got a team. Yeah, you, like why why me you know like it sucks when you you fuck up because then you're you're just like damn dude I, i'm not the guy i'm not like why why is I'm not the guy why do i have I four people at the start gate with me why do i even have a wax deck like all that stuff just like you just beat yourself Who's your down wax deck? um ryan mcdermott <laughs> waxed my board last night Your i might have been the fastest guy on the hill today yeah he's a he straight, is, he, we're gonna get him in the booth yeah, yeah. He's, a, he's a mess mm -hmm. mess doggo he is He's a from Mass champion. Yep. So going back, to, we're going to stay on this. I'm going to keep going. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, inversely, the one thing I've noticed in your career too is, you know, this is something I've noticed. is like basically when it comes down to it, there's been so many times that you're in fucking 10th place and you, it's the th final run, third run, however many runs, and it's like you're either going to get 10th or you got to land it and you fucking land it and win. And you've done that time and time again now my question to you is since you've done it if when you did it a few times were you just like oh it's the final run this is this is where i show up is that your narrative or what's your narrative in those scenarios yeah i definitely don't try and put myself in those scenarios but it has happened more times than not and i think pressure has worked good for me in the past it it fuels me it and you can let it bring you down or you can let it pump you up. And um, the fact that people sort of like believe in you or count on you as a favorite can instill confidence. It can definitely like make you nervous, but use those nerves in a positive manner and feed off them and know that's why you're in this position because you've done this. And exactly like you said, after you've done that a couple of times, sure enough, last run, X Games, whatever, know that you, you've done this and you can do this and the work's been put in and y y you know the course, you know the tricks. Just fucking do it. It's kind of an Eminem Moss spaghetti moment. Definitely. Would, He's like say. a big Moss spaghetti, spaghetti guy. Yeah. For sure. Vomit on the t-shirt already. Yeah. Absolutely. I would Super say that's, nervous. that's when you're digging deep. Yeah, and I've been so lucky to have those kind of like big moments where you jump from the bottom of the pack to the top and i think that's what are, champions do though right i don't know Thanks. i, well, I think so because i appreciate of people it. <laughs> like me i used to compete in contests i'm not talented like you guys i get in the competition and i'm just shit to bed and i'm just happy to be there you, so one thing i, I gotta ask well, you, hey i'm happy to be there don't guys like you wrong, though dig deep when, well, and win the thing is too when, when you when you fucking put all that pressure on yourself and you don't do well dealing with that is fucking horrible. It's the fucking when you show up and you're like, I'm going to win this. I'm like, you get all fired up. You've done the work. And you're the you, man, and you fall like that. That's you're the that's favorite. harder to deal with than anything. I'd imagine, right? Like in some sense, yeah. The pressure. Like, for instance, we were doing this contest in Aspen uh, this spring, and I had missed the locks open and the X Games, which are two big contests to get onto the Olympic team because of. Uh, because someone on the Canadian team tested positive in Europe, Oof. and then I eventually tested positive and couldn't go to the X Games. So that was like a three-week block. No symptoms? No symptoms. Good for you, dude. Yeah, but four for four posies. PCR, four PCR, antigen, antigen. No, I went PCR, antigen, PCR, antigen. And yeah, four for four posies. Lucky, Luckily, no symptoms. But yeah, I missed those events. Then I finally get to do a slope style event in... Aspen like a month or two later it's windy they cancel the last jump it's the first two jumps so I like totally have to make up a new run and I fall on a backside 1080 and and I was just like dude what am like I was so upset with myself and just like down and couldn't believe it and then like you just get over it and you move on and you think about new things and then there was an event the next week 
and it ended up going really well, you know? So like that stuff can get you down, but don't let it destroy you for weeks on end, you know? And when, even when I got COVID and I couldn't do the X games, I was like super down, definitely feeling depressed, like as could be. Like, couldn't believe that, like, what's up with this timing? I'm taking the most precaution I've ever taken. Like, super safe, not around anyone. And then, because the X Games coming up, I want to do it. And then I get COVID, can't do it. And I'm just devastated. And I'm like, wow. And I got an invite to the natural selection, and I haven't snowboarded in two weeks. And I don't snowboard a ton of powder, especially this year leading up to it and I was like there's no way but then sure enough you can like rise to the occasion sometimes you got to take L's to get the W mm. how do you think that compares as a street rider with your pressure <clears throat> there's it's not even the same it's because yeah, like, you can we just put, show up the next day we put pressure on ourselves and the word I mean when you battle a trick the only way I can compare is when you want something really really bad and you've been obsessing about a trick and you don't get it you go home and it's fucking. I period. see the depression. Yeah, you get clip highs, yeah. you get Dude, depressions, yeah. but but contests. Dude. These guys have more. There, there's a more whole camp. Up. There's a there's a U.S. team or a Canadian team. You got your sponsors. You got your or agent. Just, you you know got your that family. Everyone that's watching too. Yeah, yeah. it's like I said. Why home. did I ride like a barn? You know, like it happens. But even and when then, you or if you, you go ride on good, a, even if you're having a bad day, though, you just have a bad run, whatever. Yeah, but, some days. I mean, you can't show up every day. I guess exactly and. But I, I would say it's very similar in the sense even not competing. If you're really working hard towards a really awesome video part and you're on a trip and you go back to a spot two days in a row and you still don't get what you're trying, like that, those feelings are the exact same, I, I feel like. Yeah. Like that shit is hitting deep. So when you show up to something like this, Red Bull Recharged, do you feel the same, like, I want to win, or is it a little more chill, like, eh? Well... I would say you want to ride to the best of your ability because every day I go snowboarding, I want to, like, do stuff that stokes me out because that's why we do this. Um, but here we are in mid-May. I'm not really stressing about it, you yeah. know? It, it's Ben's event. We're having a ton of fun. They put a bunch of half-pipe riders together with slope cell riders, with filmers, and we have this creative park to ride it's it's more of a laid back fun feeling event and that actually sometimes can bring out the best of riding to me it looked like you wanted to win i don't know <laughs> no i think i just want to ride to the you, best of my ability and, and we're were. trying to clip you up were. and yeah yeah it's like it's fun doing your best i don't like i don't get stoked when i go home when i just do a bunch of soggy shit yeah that's a great fucking point great straight point. up point now, I, I want to be happy at the end dude, of my snowboard. Day. Yeah, and have people but, be like, "Dog, you were doing this today," and you were. It's Thank almost you. like going home bodied is a is a better feeling than going home wishing you tried something. Do you yeah. ever experience that sometimes? You're like, "Yeah, dude, I, 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 I'll, I'll go." And, and I'll we go did to see you events. get bodied today, by the way, didn't we? Yeah, back <laughs> we double were, back rodeo. We were at back. lunch down there. Like, <laughs> um, Slush face. Killer. Yeah, I'll, I'll go to events, and I'm not the guy that in the practice days is doing my tricks. I'm just like, Holding I don't want to do the, the high risk shit for no reason. Like I know I can do this trick. I'm going to figure out the airtime of these jumps and learn the rails. And then I'll do my tricks on the contest. Smart. Day. Um, but that can be like a little bit frustrating sometimes because Russ will film like all the dogs, you know, and then, or Adam, and then we'll go home, and, like, the contest is the next day, and I'm like, damn, they did, like, they did their front triple. They did, they did switch the back tricks. to pull, and I'm, like, doing, like, backside nose press and, like, a back seven and a front seven, but it's worked for me. But sometimes you're like, damn, I wish I would have, like, tried that more. Or, for instance, a contest this year, I did a switch backside 16 in my practice run, and I was like, oh, I got this. So then the next run, I just did a switchback 12, and then I fell both runs on a switchback 16. Uh, but because I landed it first try, I was like, yo, I don't need to try this I anymore. Got it. Mm -hmm. I got it. Confidence, then, keep the confidence high. Yeah, and then I, like, get in the car on the way home, and I blew it, you know, and you're just, like, devastated. Like, why didn't I just practice that a few more times? But Then you would have had it. All these little mind Maybe. games, and competing is just, like, a crazy thing. 
Is it sometimes and, and you don't want them to see you do the tricks so they don't know what you're doing? Or They do that in moto sometimes. They don't yeah. want to show the lines. Yeah. It's people jump on the line. Does that dude, happen? You, you, just you don't can, push you can play that game in snowboarding, but um, I feel like the top slow style guys yeah, are going to go for their hard shit anyways, and they know what you can do, and I know what they can do. So there's real no point in hiding stuff unless it's like rail stuff. That's where it comes in. Get like, sneaky. Because people just stand at the top, watch you do a cab over two. Oh, it goes. Boom. And, and then they do And it. they're doing your fucking rail line. It's so frustrating. That's so true. Huh? That's how the Dude, streets and work. Yeah, it is. It's like, but that's how snowboarding evolves too. Like, oh, whoa. That's progression. He, that's a possible. That's a possibility. That trick is doable. And then everyone goes and learns it. Yeah. That's what happened with the backside 14. Like, mm-hmm. it just became a staple. I mean, any trick from where it started. Yeah, front seven, front three method. So it's all when, like when I was young, at. it was seven twenty, and then each generation it just push, push, push. It's like the four minute mile or whatever. Or the, you right, know, yeah. same and thing. It, once it'll you can just do it, continually you can do it. get beaten. I gotta ask for my own personal. Do you think you get addicted to winning? I think you get addicted to riding to the best of your ability, and then the feeling of winning is pretty fucking rad like it feels good to win and you can't say it doesn't you're the man but sometimes you win and you shouldn't have won or sometimes you get third and you feel like you should have won and those feelings can be wonky at times and um but when you really hit it out of the park and you win something like downright just whoop everyone's ass that's a great feeling (laughs) and i'm not gonna say it's not do you think it gets addictive at times like you where you're like fucking you get addicted to it but uh, now in my career, after, like, having some frustrating moments with, like, judging and stuff, I've totally, like, shifted my focus to being, like, I just want to ride to the best of my ability. And if I can do that, I'll probably stand at the top of the podium. Not all the time, but I feel like I'm finding more satisfaction in riding to the best of my ability versus caring about what step i'm standing on on the podium that that's where i'm at these days it's a great reframe what's crazy though as you get older and you stop competing and you can't win anymore it can lead to depression and all that you got to get ready for that totally and i hear stories about olympians that have to be like yeah post olympic depression is, is a, real a real thing i've suicide. heard but we live in a sick sick sport we're so lucky. It's not like when the Olympics are over. Yeah, you're an ice our skater. Our sport's done yeah. for four you're, you're years. You're a loser and ice We go skater. to an event the week after the Olympics, or now with all this natural selection stuff, I'm, like, feeling so inspired by there's a whole other career for me to focus on. Like, I have I filmed a lot of backcountry in 2015 and made um, – a movie with my friends called In Motion and was lucky enough to win Rider of the Year for both publications, Snowboarder Trans- and Transworld. and Snowboarder. Yeah, and that was, that was like, for me, I was like, okay, when, when contests tier. don't work, I want to focus on backcountry. This makes me just as happy, you know? And then Natural Selection popped up this year and I was all aggy and bummed and down when I got COVID and missed all those events. And then I go to this event and have a career highlight, if not my biggest career highlight weren't like, you in the first one yeah he yeah. won it yeah because yeah I no no no, so. no. Or, oh because yeah it, the jackson hole yeah one. the jackson, jackson hole one he chris, won chris and i did a bootleg uh i don't know if you if you heard we it. did like a stream <laughs> where we watched it and it was we awesome. watched it, it was it really fun watching it. We, yeah. were, we were hyped on you awesome i don't know Thank if you were in it so, so you, you, didn't you did win right i did win yeah i don't know for that i second guess that you won for a second that's why you didn't you didn't go to the other events then because of covid well, yeah, I just was, was, I was just was allowed, that. I was just finishing my 14th day, and then I was able to fly to Jackson. Ah, uh, okay. And it, it was ever so lucky, worked out. But um, I just came out of COVID, and I was down for the count for 14 days, so I envy your no-symptom COVID. You were symptomatic? I was uh, not home, stay vacation style. I was bedridden. Crazy cough. Almost about to die style. Yeah, I cut on the phone with him, and it was like, <laughs> Really? Yeah, dying. Dang. Sorry, Easton. Thank you. Okay, we're going to get into another guest question, which is once again presented by Solomon. This is from our boy, Danny D. Here we go. This one here is for uh, Mark the Spark McMorris. Hi, He's bud. got a great Canadian oh, accent. A great I'd like to know personally, um, you 
know, is it more nerve wracking sitting at the top of like an X Games slope style or an Olympic slope style, or is it much more nerve wracking dropping next to the Travis Rice natural selection mayhem? So please fill me in as someone who's never been into a free ride contest. What's your mentality? So what stresses you out? Slope style or powder? Have a good time, bud. Good question. Even better guy. Um, Danny D. feel like he should have maybe received an invite to that event, but uh, that's a whole different story. Um, I think that natural selection, head-to-head, -head, Travis Rice, probably the most nervous I've ever been. But I was just so so happy to have made it to the final day. Like I thought Ejack was going to whoop me. Like I thought I was going to go out there and have what happened at the very first one in bald face, but I had ridden so much more powder come 2021, you know, like I was a way more experienced free rider, but you still just have those nightmares. I didn't get a lick of sleep. Straight nightmares. Yeah, like no, head, I, head to head. Yeah, head Outer, to head. So get the free run. I would say I was way more nervous for Ejac, and then obviously finals day comes, and you're like, "Damn, I would love to do well, but I, there's just no way I'm." You're up, you're up all night just stressing, and just like the 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 showing Travis had on day one, I was like, "He ain't gonna ride like that tomorrow," and um, he rode a lot better. And if he would have landed that cab nine cleaner or that double backflip, it would have been really tight. If not, he would have had the upper hand. So I think that would definitely be a more nerve wracking situation for me than riding um, at the X Games somewhere I feel super comfortable. I've done it before. I'm really up to speed on my tricks. Free riding is just so much different. Anything and, can happen. Yeah, and I would definitely – answer Danny's question as I was much more nervous dropping next to Travis Rice than I would be at my 11th X game slope style, you know? So great question. And that was an insane moment for me. And I had a ton of fun and I felt like that event was a really, really groundbreaking thing for snowboarding. So th there's a lottery and you go up against Travis Rice. Well, he, that was the, your, not your first bracket. That was your second bracket. So, the lottery goes on, and this is a funny story <laughs> because um, there the the brackets were not full. I got called, and I'm like heat five or whatever, and there's so many like Ejack could have picked like to be a first drop or a second drop in any other heat. Like there was so much open, and Ejack goes, "I want Sparky." No, yeah, he's just like I'm gonna. And this guy's <laughs> been riding powder. Like I remember shooting him like. 15 years ago in the Dude, powder he is Sonora. such an amazing he snowboarder he yeah. he i think he he got a little lost or something happened but he straight called you out <laughs> nah i don't know i think he just wanted to go against a buddy i love ejax Dude. but i was like damn he really thinks he's gonna whoop me Dude, and then, <laughs> that's fucked up Dude. and then it went the complete opposite that's way. the thing about a pow day though you know like like you got Bodie out there, powder rider, and he came up a little short on that chicken wing, and yeah, but he had his some, that Miller flip was, was insane. insane. Yeah, it was insane. So, well, everyone showed moments of brilliance, and everyone that was on that Zoe, roster dude? just uh, totally deserved to be there. But yeah, there were some people where you're just like, for sure, they're gonna just annihilate this thing, and yeah. it it doesn't always go that way. And um, some people that maybe you wouldn't think would do as well did unreal so can you can you explain also the fact that like the course it's it's blind like on a slope style course you're, you get to ride through it you get to hit all the jumps you get to feel everything for out. three days for three you days. get to do that now in this thing you're like poking your head around a tree to see how steep it is or if there's a landing right you and don't really know what the fuck you're riding for the most totally part. and there was only a few billy goat tracks that you could like vert on and go have a look but you weren't going to see everything and we had some drone footage of the course so you could like see, but you don't get a grasp on way speed steeper. Yep. and steepness and things like that or snow quality for that matter. So it was full on blind drop and kudos to Giggy for going first because that like seeing people ride it helps tenfolds. And I even think like if there's new invites next year, it will have 
it will help that they've seen how it works. There's going to be like, new invites. Yeah. Here, here's the deal. We, I love gambling. I love gambling on sports. Let's go head to head and, more. And we were like head to head is so fun for let's gambling. Bracket. The brackets are so good for gambling. Like somebody wants to talk gambling. Like let's get it going. I want to talk about it. I want to build the hype. I want to. I want to do a slope style even too. Yeah. Like we need. We need like. We need, pump I want to. I want to bet on Mark McMo and talk shit to fucking. Runky, who's betting on red or whatever it is. Like, I'm, you know, like, I want to be able yeah. to. Uh, yeah, well, I know there's a lot of agent betting. Yeah. The agents <laughs> kind of do do that. Yeah. Uh. I know Jameson and Ninja went toe to toe for years mm -hmm. between seven. I did you make him a couple bucks or what? Fuck yeah, bud. So, this is our last Patreon question. This is from Chandler Halber. How did you and your brother end up on Letter Kenny? And can the Bay Brothers really dangle? I don't know what any of that means personally. I do know what that means, but you tell them. Yeah, so our characters in the show. Okay, thank you, Chandler. Um, how Craig and I ended up on Letter Kenny is a little bit of a mystery to me. We were fans of the show, but then they, our agent in Canada, Russell Reimer, who's an absolute beautician, um, great adjective. Um, yeah, that was a good adjective. <laughs> He called us one day, and they're like, yo, they want you on the show. Let's fly out to Ontario. Let's do this. And then it got real, and I got nervous because we had, to, we had to act. And we were the Bay Brothers, and we came home from Europe from playing hockey to do Hay. So the Bay Brothers were home to do Hay, and it's, it's a neat show. If you haven't seen Letter Kenny, you got to watch it. It's really silly and really fun, and the people that – produce the show and act in it are just unbelievable um but yeah we were the bay brothers we were home from europe playing hockey and yeah we did have sweet dangles and what's the dangle it, mean i don't know what that, that means that means having soft hands if you're good with the puck good with the puck okay. hockey sweet yeah. with it yeah. yeah so um yeah watch the episode i it's got a secondary funny. question what kind of cheddar bisque we talking for a show like this nothing major kind really they're just what's another major to, i mean Kid They're like just me doesn't make money to like you, maybe. Blow up. He's doing and a Louis Vito. Yeah, you're kind of dodging the biz question right now. <laughs> no, dude, like literally, like, like next to two no grand? biz. No, no, no. Really? Like this is like we love this show. They're like, yo, come out here and do it. We had to be in Toronto for some Red Bull stuff. We're like, yo, let's just double, double whammy just this, this thing. And Craig and I flew out and pretty much did it for like a high five. You know, like we, it's a neat. It's a neat thing to be on. It's a huge show. In yeah, Canada. people love the show. I'm, I'm going to have to look this yeah. up. We'll show note it. We'll do this. Yeah, so it up. literally like next to no bisque. No maybe, shit. Maybe like some flights, you know? Yeah, yeah. But Just like, getting I'm, you I'm out not there. Like, Let's yeah, get yeah. on the show. Maybe some per diem for food. How would like you do acting? Kind. Uh, I honestly didn't struggle. I was stoked. I didn't have much to say. But like it was, we shot through the whole night. They like, feed you lines? Yeah, and it was kind of gnarly, you know, like I'm in my trailer, Craig's in his trailer, and I'm stressed. You had trailers. Oh, yeah. Like this show is not a joke. We Chris were, and I did a little acting today. We did not have trailers, but they fed us flashing. our lines, yeah. and it went well. Good. So Go I can see yeah. how it went well. Acting is gnarly. Yeah, I do is, not right? envy that life because, dude, they shoot at like the craziest hours, and you you'll have to say something like a million times it's to it's get gnarly. the right make sure the filmer's stoked and the yeah, producers uh, hyped and just like after doing some of that and we've all worked in production as you guys know and then when you see a tv show or a movie it's it's pretty impressive when you saw or, it were you hyped uh, yeah i was hyped but i'm more hyped on child actors than anything like how do they do it. How do they, they hit all, those lines? They all end up Who are we all talking? Fucked up, what child man? actors are we talking? Like, uh, have you been watching Yellowstone at all? No, oh, I heard that's they amazing. Filmed in Utah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have some friends that work on the set. I think. Yeah, it's an unbelievable show, and and the uh, the son of Luke Grimes in the show. Um, it seems like his old child actors go insane. Yeah, not all, but most. Um, <laughs> this kid is just like incredible. It's I, I'm I'm just appalled. Really, not the peep. So I want to circle back and talk about something we were talking about earlier. Now, I think you and I are both big uh, sports documentary guys, 30 for 30, uh, The Last Dance, things like that. Things that make you want to run through a wall, for lack of a better term. Um, now, what I would like to ask is, in the MJ documentary, 
uh, The Last Dance, he would create these narratives where he would basically like kind of want to just bury the people he's competing against. Now, come natural selection, did you did you create any narratives like that where you're like, I'm going to destroy this fucker? Um, the Last Dance is amazing, by the way. But I, honestly, I think at the natural selection, it was more... I was super lucky. I, I, I got to drop second in pretty much every round, which is unreal because the highest score would get the, the, the final drop in each heat. I was really lucky to get that most of the time. Um, so once I would see them go, obviously you're like watching them, hope they don't get hurt, but hopefully they don't lace the world's best run, but you're stoked, you know? And, and when they would drop in, I'd be like, okay, hey, I'm going to do a better run than that. You know, and that's the narrative. I wouldn't say I was like, yo, I'm going to put this person in the dirt. But <laughs> definitely, like, I'm going to fucking whoop his ass. <laughs> I love so, to hear that. back to hot takes, we always But uh, then when I, like, then I got past Travis, and I'm literally competing against my best friends. Like, I was up against Mikkel and Ben. So I'm, like, just hoping everyone lands good runs. But, yeah, I would like to land the better run. But I wasn't so much... Like I, maybe I was against Travis and uh, Ejac. Like I, I was like, yo, these lib guys are not going to see the light of I'm day. Not, <laughs> I hate to break it to you, Mark. I, I bet against you in my bracket. Hey, and a lot of guys would, but now you're fucked. <laughs> <laughs> so let's keep it moving too because, uh, I mean. Hot takes? Yeah, yeah, we're going to get into hot takes. Uh, I'm interested to hear his hot takes. Yeah, we like to talk about the uh, Michael Jordan of snowboarding. Or for, your, for the Canadians, we'll go Gretzky. Who's uh -huh. the Gretzky? Wayne Gretzky. I don't know if that changes anything, but probably not. He's the, the Gretzky greatest, right? in Canada. No, no, yeah, Gretzky's the best. Is that his I'd nickname? The greatest. He's the he's, he's undeniably the greatest hockey. That's player That's his nickname, though, right? The greatest. The great one. The great, great one. one. Okay. And I actually was at his place in L.A. and played at his country club recently. I became pretty close friends with his son, and I got to hang with the great one. And it was fucking. Sick. I've seen him play, man. Okay, we I've need. Can you play. tell us about this experience? It was really neat. I went to his place and um, with his son, and he had just finished up a round, and he was heading to San Diego to watch his daughter play tennis. But just like I, I was starstruck, man. I was like, "Yo, that's the great one!" And he was so calm and cool, and spent time chatting with me, and um, wanted to know all about what I did, and was just. He's the great one. It was the so neat. One. And if we're going to talk the great one, he's Canadian. Devin Walsh is our great one. Uh, Facts. So you're going to Devin Walsh is the great one. Of snowboarding. Canada. Oh, but I don't, I don't think there's a great one of snowboarding. You got the Devin Walsh. You got Terrier, Palmer, all these guys. Those guys are all the greatest. They did the most. They paved the way for us. Um, and then... Like in Scandinavia, Johan Olofsson, like all those guys. Dude, for your age to hear you throwing out these names is impressive. Old heads are hyped. Because this guy's Cheers. throwing J.P. Walker out, and you're throwing people from my generation. But J.P. and Jeremy were the Facts. goats of Facts. our of their, growing up. Of their time. But to hear you actually know, like they say Yo Johan, yeah. Palmer, like that's Dude, so dope. I'm, I'm well educated on snowboarding. I love this sport more than anything. This is my life, and I've – devoted everything to this so i i definitely don't want to be one of those kids that doesn't know know the facts yeah, of the past and there are a lot of kids like that and it there's pisses so me many off. it's a bummer um, this is totally random offshoot going back to the great one but there's a documentary on gretzky i don't remember the name of it where they basically take gretzky they take jerry rice they take a bunch of the greats and yeah. they essentially try to figure out what they all have in common and the, there's a lot of great hockey players that played through the NHL that had great careers, but the ones that are really the the goats, you know, the the top of the charts and statistically wins all that stuff. Um, the the thing that separated them, I found this super interesting, was unstructured play. So Gretzky grew up playing on the pond, and him and his buddies would fuck around and shoot into a trash can and stuff like that. And so he essentially learned how to play creatively on his own without coaching. He wasn't coach. Now, in snowboarding, you see the role of coaching where you some kids just show up. Like, I listened to an interview with Chloe Kim. I think it was Chloe Kim. I don't remember, but I, I don't want to throw anybody on the bus. But 
forgive me if I'm wrong, but I think they, they asked her, like, how did your run go? She's like, I just did what my coach told me to do. Now, what do you think about, like, the role of kind of that, we'll call it unstructured play, which is going and riding with your friends and just pushing each other and getting creative versus, like, kids growing up listening to their coaches? Yeah, unstructured play is the way to have longevity and to enjoy the sport forever. If there's someone calling the shots for you in snowboarding, that's not good. That's not good for our sport. And I I believe that having a coach around is part of it in some sense. I've never really had that, so to speak. But if they're literally telling you the run you should be doing, that's, that's a scary world to be living in. Um, I've been super lucky in the sense that, like, the guy I would travel with for my whole career um, was Adam Burwell, and he is my childhood best friend. He's only five years older than me, but he's wise beyond his years and a super responsible person and has helped me so much. And he he was an amazing, or he is an amazing filmer, and we would just document everything. That's how we we would learn or coach you know if we go to an event film everything and i'm gonna watch it over and see what i did wrong there's not a coach at the top of the half pipe or the top of the slope cell that can do anything close to what the athletes dropping in and doing so how are you gonna tell them how to do it you know a coach is there to be supportive to tell you you got it if it looks good and it's there to help you plan out a run if you're like, yo, I don't know if I can get from from switch to regular on that feature and what a trick might look like that, like throw some tricks out that I can do that could go there, you know? Those, like, those helpful tips are beneficial, but if someone's literally calling the shots for you, that's that's scary. And I've been lucky enough to never have that in my career. And the unstructured play lives way more in slope style than it does in half pipe because I know that it can be like that in half pipe. And especially when you show up every week and you're going to get six hits in a half pipe, how are you ever going to really change your run? Like if it's working, you know, it's, that's what was so fun about when Danny was competing in half pipe, you could always expect something different than the other riders and something different from him than what you saw the week previous. Um, Yeah. Coaches, man, that's cool that you say that and relate it to the unstructured play because I I feel like I've a lot of the true snowboarders have really taken that approach and did what they felt was going to do good and did what they wanted to do. And if you're doing what you're wanting to do and you're having fun, it's probably going to work out better. And it shows in your riding too. When you when you see somebody's having fun, you it their body language is different. They're looser, you know. Yeah. Um, it's totally a different, a different thing. And I, I think, like you said, you know, a, a coach's goal is to say, instill confidence and just say, "Yeah, you got this." Be you know? there for you. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. need a sip of water. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> your headphones charged. Things yeah. like that. <laughs> that's that's what's needed. And support support team. Now, uh, this is a conversation that comes up a lot is, you know, the spins and the rotations are getting larger and larger, especially with with big air, for example. Um, And obviously the the big spins are more difficult, but uh, I believe that the effect it's having on the viewers in some senses, they're like, even I'll say myself, I'm lost sometimes. Like I I don't, I'm pretty well versed in snowboarding and I don't know what the fuck trick that was, but it looked crazy. Now, what what do you think about things heading in that direction, and uh, yeah, what's your what's your take on that? Yeah, it it can be overwhelming, and I think it's at times totally unrelatable, which uh, which is tough. But some things I've advocated for, which I'm happy is implemented in a lot of things now. Like you used to, sometimes it'd be like two out of the five runs count. Doesn't matter which way you spin. You can spin cabin backside, front side, and switch backside. And to me, that's not that dope because it's not two directions. So now at a lot of events, you'll have to spin left and right. So like you can either do cab or backside or front side or switch backside. And I think 
that's really important, you know. And then in the qualifying rounds now, they're implementing that out of three runs, two count, and you got to spin both ways. And that's then you don't end up in the finals with two runs out of three counting, and you have to spin both ways. But the guy got through with only one run counting and qualifiers and does a backside triple, but he can't spin the other way, you know. So we're helping, like, we're trying to get the the more well-rounded slope style riders into the finals in big air versus the one trick pony. Um, but I, yeah, I don't know, man. It's, it's just the way it is. I'm sure it seemed like a lot of rotations 10 years ago and that's just kind of what's happening now too. Well, one thing I'd like to ask you personally is in, maybe this is naive in the sense that it's, it's regression. It's not progression, but when I look at certain tricks, take a tour gear, uh, Bergram. Bergam switchback five method, method, you know, or for example, like a back rodeo nine is fucking beautiful to and me, hard right? and hard. Exactly. And so like, I've always, I've, I've, I beat it to death on the podcast, but I'm always saying, you know, one jump should be mandatory under 1080 because I, I, I cab nine can be a very slow, even 1080s can be really smooth and slow. But what I'm wondering is like, what are your thoughts on kind of preserving some of that, uh, beautiful looking tricks in competition. Yeah, I think that's a really good idea. And the Aaron style totally did have that. It was five or under for one of the hits and then whatever, go nuts on your other ones. But um, I think that would be neat to implement that again and have something under a nine or under a 1080. And then you would at least get one of those guys that like really stands out and has a nut under a nine that's just like mind-boggling and that could be implemented into the score i think it'd be great for the viewers and the fans because it's like dude i think anybody can watch a switchback five upside down fucking method and be like that was dope that was awesome yeah. like who was it who said if you're having showing the judges you're having fun you're winning james jackson I yeah, believe james jackson um oh yeah and you guys interviewed james he's yeah. a beauty yeah he's awesome yeah i just i just wonder if they're if that's just realistic thought but um i don't know you yeah, look at it from it, but viewership then, then we go back to the subjectiveness and then it gets all sticky get again true yeah it's not the difficulty versus flavor right it's kind of a intangible thing it's tough but i think that could be really nice for the viewers and for the riders too just mm -hmm. work on some of those like really unique slower tricks mm-hmm Beautiful. Uh, you know, obviously, throughout your career, you've had some crazy injuries. And, uh, you know, that's that the arc of that story has been told a lot. And, you know, you've broken, I mean, how many bones, bones have you? What are your, just give us a quick cliff notes of your injuries for the listeners. Yeah. Um, up until 2016, I was feeling pretty damn invincible. I had the best season of my life. Um, and then I went to the Aaron Style right before the U.S. Open and it was in LA and I hit a bump and snapped my femur and just that a was, bump yeah I was riding like, off the jump, it's, it's, the jump. It's always riding something. away from the jump and just doing yeah like survive a front side triple and then break your leg in the on landing. a bump yeah um and then that was like holy I'm not invincible this is crazy I have seven months ahead of me and I have a rod in my femur now um well, so they hammered a rod in yeah, and that's when I was like, "Whoa, okay, um, this is this is my life now." And I worked my ass off and got back into snowboarding come August, I think, and worked really hard and enjoyed it and was having more fun than ever and did really well in some events and filmed some good backcountry stuff. And then I was out in Whistler with my brother and. I did a front three, and as I was going off the takeoff, my heels sunk really hard, and it was kind of like a field goal landing, and just front three right into a tree. Drifted way more than expected, and, yeah, I broke 17 bones, like my jaw, all the ver like all my ribs on my left side, seven vertebrae, pelvis, um, ruptured spleen, collapsed lung, like, all I, I one, can't even all in one go. Yeah, I can't even remember how, what happened. Like, how does one recover from that? 
Yeah, I don't know. I, I Someone was watching over me because, like, if you have a crash that bad, there's got to be something that's, like, somewhat permanent or to take you out of the sport, yes. you know? So the fact that I was given an opportunity to fully recover and do what I love again was the biggest blessing on earth and um, sucks to talk about, but I'm, like, that has changed my perspective on life and what I do and my appreciation for our sport and um, our culture and just and your body. I'm just like happy to be around, you know, I, it was pretty touch and go. Like, honestly, when you have your spleen rupture, you have 90 minutes and the heli got to me in like 85 minutes. Are you serious? Yeah. We were at the mountain talking to Brock today. And he said you guys were kind of recovering together, and you kind of gave him pointers. Right? You kind of instilled in him that every win at the gym was a win, and you got to take it as a win. Yeah, like if you can like use your leg a little bit better the it's next a, it's day, a better like day. That, that's a that's a W. You need to look for the small victories when you have those major injuries. Like any little progression should be celebrated in your mind, you know, and you should get a high from that and be excited and know that you're on the road to recovery. And yeah, I've definitely had to reach out to many folk. Uh, more people break their femur than a guy would think. And once you break your femur and there's films about it and things, there's a lot of people reaching out about having that same injury and to talk to you. Yeah. And I try and get back to everyone in that sense. And then, yeah, I'm just so, so damn lucky that I can snowboard still. It's amazing. Well, going going back to the one thing I got to kind of personally want to lean into is going through a femur break or all those bones breaking, there's obviously, like, got to be some fucked up lows. Like, did you have some lows where you're just like, dude, like, tough times, not sure if you're going to come out of it? Did you hit that point at all? Yeah, I... Luckily, like with my femur, I broke it. I was on site when Danny broke his in New Zealand and like was right there and dealt with it and watched him come back and just do amazing things. So I had a lot to like be stoked about and knowing that like this is a femur, this happens, it's going to be okay. Um, so the, the, the morale during that was pretty high, but like the one when I hit the tree – that was the lowest of lows. Like, that was so painful and uncomfortable for, like, months. Jaw. Jaw. Just, like, literally couldn't move. Two weeks in the hospital and then a month in the hotel in Vancouver where, like, I couldn't. Like, I was literally. You couldn't like, even go home. I was, like, stuck. Yeah, because you couldn't fly because it collapsed my lung. Uh. And, um, yeah, it was tough. And, like, that's when you really got to count on your inner circle and, like, people that. You you really see who's got your back, you know, and a lot of people have my back, and so many people reached out and and were super supportive through the whole thing. So much appreciated, air hole to the whole community. Yeah, you are definitely truly beloved by the snowboard community, and one thing I got to admire is the fact that you are larger than life, most winning is slope style rider out right now. You know, for the past decade at least, and maybe more. And then you're still, you still care about the community. You still give a shit, and and they care about you in that injury, and they showed that love. And uh, the the thing that I kind of want to touch on real fast is that Coco, uh, Coco Ho, your significant other, who's awesome, just met her for the first time on this trip. Let's give her an air horn. Yeah, coax. She, um, not in a corny way, because everybody says like, you know, it's just stay positive, right? But she she was kind of admiring the fact that like, you just are naturally a very positive person, like you said, sm celebrating the small wins, uh, those type of things. It seems like that type of character uh, probably attributed to your to your recovery heavily, I'd imagine, right? Yeah, I think I appreciate Coco saying that because some days weren't all that positive, and she was definitely a huge rock in my recovery and helping me through everything from getting out of bed to... <laughs> And same with Adam Burwell, the, those two people like took care of me. And of course my folks, my brother, he was on site, had to deal with the whole thing of calling on the sat phone and like trying to keep me alive. You know, like I think that was pretty traumatizing for him as well. But yeah, man, it's once I woke up, like I was in induced coma and stuff. And once I woke up, 
I was like, I can't not be positive. I'm given another chance. And there's, there's always something to be grateful for. And like to be positive is just so much easier, I think. And sometimes in the tough times, it cannot be as easy, but you got to just like keep reminding yourself that if, if you're creating a positive energy around you, you're going to heal better. You're going to do better. You're going to succeed way more than if you're around anything negative. And, um, I, I definitely try and be positive because I live a great life and I want to share it with people and I want to share what I've learned and, um, be a part of the snowboard community and keep it, keep it friendly and like, hype each other up because after all we're just enjoying snowboarding right beautiful beautifully said 100 percent. and uh it's definitely you know cruising around with you you treat every every single border you meet on the hill the same as you treat you know the sean white or whoever you meet it seems like it's just it doesn't matter you treat everybody the same and that, that was actually really uh special talking to your dad um i was kind of uh giving him giving you some praise about your character and where he got it from. And, and he was hammering on the fact that he's like, you know, I, I always said, I think you said res respect gets respect, you know, and, and kind of like you said earlier in our Patreon interview, you don't treat others like you want to be treated. I know it's cliche. It's corny. It's been said a million times, but you know, you walk around doing that and, and uh, good things will happen. You'll get the puck on your stick. <laughs> yeah. Get a shot on that. <laughs> totally. Um, make yourself open, get open. Yeah. And literally, uh, Sometimes you can seem larger than life, but if you treat that person that might want to meet you like the homie, because that's all they really are, is the homie that loves snowboarding mm -hmm. too, and they just want to shoot the shit with you. And if you give them the time of day, that's a life-lasting impression. And I can vividly say that with 100% confidence because I've been that kid meeting my heroes and the ones that were really cool are the ones that are still in snowboarding and still beloved. Mm -hmm. Well said. Uh, I want to touch back on also something you said earlier when you're talking about uh, this, you know, Brock brought it up. He's like, I was, I was going through my recovery. I was talking to uh, Mark and he basically was, was letting me know, like, celebrate the small wins right and and then and what is that? That, that is kind of positivity, right? You're, you're, and, and it sucks because they're like, positivity just be positive it's hard right but but celebrating the small wins is, is a great way to frame that because you can look at people that do simple things like you wake up you make your bed that's a small win you you do what whatever you go through like oh i did a front seven i landed it. that's a small win and if you can build on that like success doesn't necessarily come from like doing one great thing it's building on all those small wins like your career your career and where you're at right now has come from building on small wins and now like hearing your road to recovery and where you're at. And then also just seeing like probably, I don't know, am I putting, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but is that kind of how you approach snowboarding in life and being positive or totally. And you're not putting words in my mouth. It's literally just the way I look at life. If you celebrate the small wins, you're going to get bigger wins and you got to just go down life's path with that motive in mind, because if, if you're not enjoying every little special thing that happens, it just gets jaded and lame and everything sucks. And like, you know, like, why me? Why is this happening to me? Yeah. Like, and especially and we, down for we're, seven months, right? And we're all guilty of sometimes being down and being like, like why me? Why this timing? But like literally it's super cliche, but everything does happen for a reason. And if you can be positive through the negative times, the other side will be so much more grand. I think negativity breeds negativity. And the more 100%. you're negative, it just stacks, stacks, stacks. So a win's a win. Yeah. And dude, anytime I'm feeling negative and I just seriously step back and like, look at my life. How could I ever be negative? You got to be positive. We're all so lucky. We have our health. We're snowboarding. We have this community too. That's yeah. unbelievable. Oh yeah. man, dude, your, your dad said, the, sorry to interrupt you. Your dad said the coolest thing though. He said, uh, you know, he's got a bit of a Canadian accent. He's like, yes, yes, he he's like, Oh Mark, you know, I played a lot of hockey and uh, I, I don't want to butcher it, but he's like, he's essentially saying I played a lot of hockey and you know, 
it wasn't about the wins. It was about the experience and the people. Mm. And it was just like, boom. That that's comes with age. But that's just such a, it's, that's tr- those, re- you know, those small interactions, those relationships. That's what you remember. How did that person make you feel? How was that, you know? Dude. And that's, that's the truth. And we've been so lucky to be immersed in so many different cultures and the people we've met. Like, Countries. Dude, it's insane. Like the, how we've been given a gift to be these well-rounded people that experience different cultures and different walks of life and all these things. If you can embody all that and implement that into your own being, that is going to make you a stronger, better person. And um, take the positives out of every person you meet and the things you like about them and try and implement that into your life because, damn, man, that's that's important. Well, dude, going back to what you said, uh, you know, get, get open, get the puck on your stick, right? Uh, the way I just equated that <laughs> is open. essentially like every person you meet is an opportunity to get the puck on your stick. If you're cool to that person... They might pass you the puck. Yeah, if you're not you. cool, they're never going to pass you the puck. Exactly. Get open. Mundo. Let, let's get the fucking biscuit on the stick. Let's find some twine. Let's get a couple dangles. Let's go top shelf. <laughs> knock the bottle. <laughs> you know what I mean? I want to see that bottle squirt. <laughs> yes, you, you just do so much harky, hockey jargon at me. Dude, that was, say, dude that was incredible. Dude. Wow. Woo. That like, probably uh, felt good. His yeah, shit, honestly, I'm good, telling dude. you, this guy's motivation. I, I feel like I'm on a Tony Robbins. I'm going to put the headset on, run dude, through a wall. You right should have heard this guy throw some surf surf lingo at uh, Coco today. That oh, yeah. Her away, dude. I introduced, uh, I was talking about, uh, <laughs> Reef being, Chief. you guys are on the oh, North the, the North Shore. Yeah. And uh, where I picture that, like, you know, she's talking about fighting for waves, and she's saying, well, you know, I, I kind of, I give Mark waves. Like, I kind of tee him up. And I'm like, oh, you're kind of like the reef chief out there. She's like, what's that? I'm like, the reef chief. like the Chief of the reef. The, the, al- <laughs> the chief of the alpha male out there calling the shots in the waters. You never heard it. Ne- I never heard it either. And it's, I haven't either. Yeah, but it's, now it's, it's in stick. my vocab. I'm giving myself an air horn. Yeah, you, I don't know if you made that up or you heard that. but I heard that somewhere. But yeah. That's, that's, that's going to stick right there. Maybe we'll make a bomb hole reef chief shirt. No, we, Mark makes face on it. Yeah, let's go reef chief. Yeah. Coco is a doll to surf with. Um yeah, she said Just, she helped you read the ocean in the past three months, huh? Yeah, she's helped me a lot over the years. But I finally put in a big stint when COVID happened. I flew from Alaska to Hawaii and stayed there for three months. And just, like, surfing 45 out of, like, 60 days, like, consistently, you just get better at something. Yeah. Feeling fit, and, I bet. Yeah, I am not in the shape I was then. <laughs> um, <laughs> surfing is a healthy, healthy sport. It's great. Um, hard tough paddling yeah geez man and they make it look so easy and just like reading the ocean and things like that so yeah you got a shadow boxer and you're gonna get waves and sometimes when we're in foreign countries or we're not on the north shore if, if she like paddles for something a lot of people will stop <laughs> and then <laughs> you see sparky <laughs> ah, and then out. you come out <laughs> yeah I, I'll, she you she lets me burn her. That's so, so sick. God, I'm lucky. <laughs> yeah, that's badass. I've heard, yeah, I've heard uh, much improvement. From much her. improvement. Um, I saw the air in fucking Waco. Thank you. Jesus. I'm getting better, man. I, I'm really starting to learn, but it's it's not the the moment when I'm up on my feet. It's learning to read the ocean. That is the hardest thing ever to know where it's going to break, when to start paddling, how far to go out. Like, I'm going lefts on rights. I, yeah, I don't, I'm exactly. going straight. I'm more going, I'm more yeah, going straight. I'm, I'm a straight, straight guy. Like I don't go st- diagonal. I go where, straight where's down. Where's the west wave going? I have no <laughs> idea. Dude, it is such a neat thing to learn and such a humbling sport. Yeah, the man. second you think Sometimes you know I get it. down on myself surfing. Yeah. That is you know like, it it I'll just you. get like, and then sometimes you feel like you're going to die. Like, dude, I've surfed some big waves and during quarantine – our friend Landon McMara um, towed me into some waves and like some big ass waves and my leash broke and he like kind of like fell off the jet ski and I wasn't like close enough to shore and I was pretty out to sea and I was treading water for my life and I was like, holy shit, I'm going to die surfing. Like I've had some of those moments too. And it, yeah, it's an insanely humbling sport and I'm uh really up for learning more and I think everyone should try surfing. One of my <laughs> earlier times surfing in Mexico, I got caught in a riptide. I had no yeah. idea you're supposed to go left or right. 
and they had to come out and rescue. I was like halfway out to sea. Yeah, dude, that's go scary. Left, you got to res- right. respect the ocean. You just move like three feet and you're out of the riptide. Yeah, as and soon not, as you think like, you have it down to a science, you just get absolutely humbled. Hammered. All right, you got an option to go pro surfer, pro hockey, pro snowboard. What you picking? Honestly, I don't think I'd change a thing. Ooh. Solid answer. God damn, you're getting respect from the from the crew for that answer. It's true though. We we live a pretty sick life. I bet I all, love oh, spending I bet time in the mountains. Life, though. The mountains are incredible. And I have a lot of friends that play in the NHL and I have a lot of friends that surf for a living and honestly I wouldn't change it. This is this has been the neatest ride ever. And I'm just like if it stopped tomorrow I'd be forever grateful for what I've been able to um see and the people I've been able to meet and the places that I've got to snowboard. It's just it's been a dream. That's beauty. Beautiful. Um, now going back earlier we we're talking about, you know, staying humble and things like that. And I always feel as uh you kind of mentioned as well, that your camp around you, the people around you, your family, you know, keep you humble in the sense that like, you know, I have an older brother, older sister, and you know, they my brothers like I've punched my brother in the face as hard as I can. Like we he's you need somebody to tell you like cut you down in a sense, right? Keep you grounded. And I feel like Craig has had that uh, role heavily. Totally. He plays that role. And yeah, I think I play it with him too a little bit. You know, I don't feel like he looks at me as like his younger brother. I think we look at each other as the best of friends and we want to help each other succeed. And yes, we fight heavily and I've also punched my brother in the (laughs) face and he's punched me in the face and that's fine. Still love him to death. And he, he's kept me humble. Coco's kept me humble. Everyone's kept me humble. And I feel like everyone plays that role. You have to play that role for others and other people have to play it for you. And it's a give and take thing. And yeah, Craig and I have fed off each other our whole lives. Like, if he learned to backflip on a snowboard, I would have to learn it the next day. Like, it just, you couldn't go on with your brother being able to do something you couldn't. And um, to this day, it's just a full-on competition. And He's a year different? Like, year and a half? Yeah, he's a year. He's almost two years almost older two. than me. And, That's uh, close, though, right there. Super close. We had the same group of friends growing up. Yeah. And, yeah, he's... He's been my rock, and I, I would like to think I've been his. And um, we never would have succeeded as snowboarders without each other. Not not even remotely close. Fuck, that's cool to hear. Uh, we have a guest question from your brother, Woo! which is presented by Solomon. Here we go. Howdy, Bombhole family. Uh, Craig McMorris here. Longtime caller, first-time listener, actually. It's been brought to my attention that uh, your guest on today's program is Mark McMorris. Now, um, I have a lot of questions. I always want to ask Mark McMorris, but uh, I'm going to keep it to one here. Mark, do you remember the time you were the Grand Marshal of the Calgary Stampede? If you do, can you explain a little bit about that, especially the parade? And then can you also try and take a guess at how many cocktails we put down on that one? (laughs) Have a good one, boys. East Stone. Thank you. Chris, love you guys. Much love. I think he he got his words mixed up there. Yeah. I think he was supposed to say first time caller, long time listener, because yes. I've watched plenty of bomb holes with him. Mm-hmm. Um, so Craig's one with words, but he fucked up. Um, I was a grand marshal of the Calgary Stampede. Uh, for folks that don't know what that is, it's the biggest rodeo in North America. And um, it was a great honor. I don't know how the hell I got the nod for that because there's one grand marshal every year and there's been some heavy hitters in that position, but I was definitely honored and it was a, uh, it was an exciting moment. I, I rode on a horse in the parade and that was really fun and did a lot of neat things around the whole thing. It was obviously really fun being at the rodeo events. Those guys are incredible. Um, Those dudes take slams. Holy crap. I don't know how their backs work, especially like when they, the bucking Bronco, like bareback riding, that is so gnarly. And then, um, yeah, we probably, probably close to a hundred tequila sodas. A hundred. <laughs> we're going a hundred. <laughs> oh, we were there for three days. Uh, 
wow. <laughs> no, dude. and then we had a bunch of our <laughs> These friends. guys were getting banged up. Yeah. All, all banged, all up. banged up. Oh, dude. my God. A hundred. You I think last time I saw you, you might have had a hundred tequila and <laughs> sodas. If you don't remember that, at the uh, Volcom spot, Ricky Melnick and you were hanging out. You probably don't remember. That sounds oh. like a very long time ago. DDS Costa days. Mesa? Yeah, I, I think so. Falcom Snowboarder Meg from yep. Yeah. You were all banged up. Yeah, I was pretty banged up. It was good. It's all good. It's great. A hundred, though. That's heavy. You know, no, no. I'm saying like over three, three days, days between our friends. Um, oh, okay. Between they treated the you guys like royalty, according to your, your mom was saying. It was yeah, like it, was, it was like next level. Like in Canada, to be the Grand Marshal of the Stampede, I didn't really know what it meant. But I mean, it means some dog serious shit. like VIP shit, like next level. I was tripping. It was really fun, and they let us bring like the whole squad. It was, it was a weekend that I'll never forget. You, you know, I think we'd I'd like to throw their name in the hat. I think uh, Jed Anderson would be a great Grand Marshal. Oh, He's a that, Calgary yeah, loke. He would be great. He I'd would. love to see him on that horse in the way. In Me the too. way, in. you're almost like Stampede. a Mountie at that point. Yeah, that's, that sounds awesome. Jeez. I don't know if Jed would think it's that cool, but <laughs> dude, I think anyone would probably. Big shouts to cool. Jed. Let's give him an air horn. Yeah, Jed. Um, but yeah, I've recently also been um, added to the family of Salento Organic Tequila, which I'm really, really excited about. Taylor Steele, amazing film, a surf filmmaker um, for years, has endeavored into tequila and. Craig and I are in there, and I think there's some heavy hitters along with like well, the, like co- the Birdman co- co- and the stoke? Slater. And like, you guys are going to sell the shit out of some tequila. Yeah, what are think, we what's talking? The, what's I think the it's going really well. Salento Organic Tequila. Organic Tequila. So you can get shit faced and feel like you're still uh, uh, feeling yeah, pretty good healthy. about yourself. Placebo. No, <laughs> <laughs> um, no it's, it it's actually real, like really, really high end tequila, and it's not cheap. But we talking Patron really style or what? Some high end Patron bus. Compared really to compared this, to this? Yeah. Wow, this is big baller. That's heavy. Damn. Yeah. So, uh, if you'd like the agave, try it out. I'll, okay, I'll test it. Thank you. I'll send you a bottle. All How right. about that? I'm so down. So, one thing we should talk about before we wrap things up because we're getting kind of close to the end here. Uh, you and Craig have a great foundation. What's up with the foundation? Yeah, we've been doing foundation work for eight or nine years now and recently have made way more of a push into it and it's literally the mcmorris foundation is to help underprivileged youth find their passion through sport and if they don't have the need or the means for travel equipment registration whatever it may be we got you and it doesn't need to be any particular sport. If you want to snowboard, we got you. If you want to play hockey and you can't afford it, we got you. So literally it all stems from the fact that Craig and I had pretty much every opportunity to play any sport under the sun. And I give a lot of credit to that in who we are. It helps shape you as a person. Playing sports literally helps you in all aspects of life. And that's been made apparent to Craig and I. So we really want to make sure that if anyone is wanting to play sports and they can't financially afford it, then we're there for them. And that's a good feeling. And I want to give back. And that's basically the gist behind the McMorris Foundation. And we've had some really rad events. We have a slow pitch tournament. We've been a big part of in Saskatoon, there's this thing called the Optimus Hill. It's right in the city, and they have, like, a rope tow now and, like, a little park. So kids, like, you don't need to go to the mountain. You can just go after school or on lunch break, go whip a few laps. And I'm pretty proud of that, like, just the fact that we're giving kids opportunity. And it's it's catching a lot of, lot of uh, momentum, and people are psyched on it in the province. And, um, yeah, it feels good to give back. Are you uh, re- getting donations? Or are you guys funding this yourselves? Or? We do a bit of funding ourselves, and then we raise money as well. And, like, we have a celebrity softball tournament. We it's That's it's, what I want to dive into. Are you going to come out? Uh, uh, Dude, oh, first of all, amazing. if you're inviting me, I will be there okay. 100%. Second of all, 
I want to know who's a problem out there. Like I know Danny D is he is he going yard or who who's who's smacking him? Danny's hitting dingers. He's going um, dingers. Okay. Zion wasn't much of a ball. Really, or a, wasn't much the, of a the baseball pro skater? player. Yeah, was he whiffing? Cal Whiffkin Jr. Or Dude, what? it Cal was Wiffkin. so funny. Just like seeing people that had played ball before, opposed to the athletes that had. Like You're looking at a third baseman. You're looking okay. at a third baseman. Right on. Okay, yep. Um. It's seriously the most fun ever. Like we have NHL players, pro skateboarders, bobsledders, like Bob like the most eclectic group of people you could put in a room and just like mash them together. It was so fun. There's tons of laughs, lots of money raised for an important cause and it's just a riot. We love doing it and we want to do it more and hopefully when COVID's all sorted out, we get back to it. That's cool. Um, but yeah, like I said, it feels good to give kids opportunities that you had, and uh, I I give a lot of credit to the opportunity I had through sport. Killer. Uh, to keep things moving along here, we like to talk about setups. Yeah. Now, uh, what board are you riding? What do you do to it? What's your? You got any quirky things you do with your setup? Stance with that kind of stuff too. Um, Burton process one fifty seven. I used to make modifications to it. They've been implemented into the stock now, which I'm very proud of. Um, I think it's made it a better board. Um, moves a lot of units, so to speak. So we work really tightly on the, the graphic. Um, and I've made it a little bit stiffer under the bindings, things like that. It's a great board. It's an all-round board. I ride it every single day day that I'm snowboarding unless I'm in the backcountry and then I'm on a 160 hometown hero and I play around a lot more there with different boards and different shapes and things like that but yeah the 157 process I've been on that for that's a Burton staple right? yeah there, I've been right? on that for like 11 years yeah. like UC used to ride it forever and then when he stopped like we rode it together for a long time as well because he was still on Burton and when he stopped snowboarding I'm sort of like one of the only guys riding it. Um, and then the masses ride it a lot. And then I'm using the Malavita binding. I use a medium binding with small straps. like my shit tight. Um, forward lean? None. None. No Zero. forward lean. No. Wow. 21 and a half for a stance. That's my stance. I think I'm like 11 and negative 7. Um, negative 5 a lot of the time. And then when I'm riding POW, I'm like, 15 and zero um and that works for me edges uh, i think too, ryan right? takes the the like the very slightest barks has bite off uh just yeah. on the, like the contact points yeah like like next to nothing because i do like to have my edges you know i'm not the guy taking the the file full d well, you can't you physically can't ride a transition feature that's icy yeah. slope style contest without, without edges. your edges. Exactly. And that shows on the people that do. <laughs> that do. <laughs> yeah. Also, the you, it's, it's probably a bit of a stiff dogger in some senses, right? The board? Yeah. Or is um, I wouldn't say it's like any stiffer than a custom or anything. And I don't I don't really like put anything special into it anymore. I used to think it was a little too soft. We, we stiffened it up a bit um, and it's working great. I do stiffen up the hometown hero a bit by like 10%. Um, cause I like a stiffer board in the pow, but yeah, I'm, I'm really happy with my gear and I've been, uh, working with them for years to like dial it in. And, um, it's been a couple of years now that I've been like really happy with it and not really putting any mods on anything. Perfect. Um, okay. Now, lastly, we'd like to give you an opportunity to thank anybody or any shout outs before we kind of dip, um, wrap this things up. Yeah. First and foremost, thank you, snowboarding. Thanks to the whole community for always supporting and having my back. Thanks to my sponsors. Thanks to my family. Thanks to my friends. Thank you, Eastone. Thank you, Chris, for an amazing addition to our snowboarding community. I look forward to the bomb holes. I'm honored to be on it. And um, Giving me chills right there, dog. It's all love. Fuck, thank you so much. Hey, uh, thanks, Mammoth, for hosting this. That's pretty yeah. tight. Big yeah, tight. little Eight. off-site. This is first. Fun. You're the yeah, first, first ever uh, off-site. I will, might, I will admit, I was worried. I was like, I don't know how it's going to be, but Chris talked me into it, and I'm very happy I did it. We this are is, too, man. This is epic. Absolutely. Now, before we wrap up also, the Olympics is coming up. You uh, 
haven't got the gold yet. Are you are you uh, are you losing sleep over that? Is that something you got on the docket, or are you like whatever happens happens? I just want to ride my best, and of course, I'd like to change the shade of my medal. But I gotta get to the Olympics first. I gotta stay healthy. I gotta land some shit if I do get there. When's the Olympics? And then we'll we'll see what happens. Next winter. Next winter. Next winter. <clears throat> okay. Well, I'll tell you this. Uh, I noticed that you invested in the um, agave tequila. Uh, we'd like to maybe present the opportunity to invest in bomb hole sniffing salts as well before we get out of here. So um, you guys show me a product. <laughs> I could throw some cheddar biscuit away. <laughs> we got products, man. Well, Dude, beautiful. I'm into it, man. All right. Well, beautiful. Thank you guys so much for listening, watching. We really appreciate you guys for tuning in and uh, we appreciate you for coming on the show and we will see you next week over and out from the bomb hole.